Welcome to the February 2nd meeting of the Penfield Board of Education. This meeting is called back to order at 7.06 p.m. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, at this point, it's uh, recommended that the board approve the February 2nd, 2021 agenda as, submission, as submitted. May I please have a motion and a second that the agenda for February 2nd, 2021 Mark, you're, be approved. You're not, we can't hear you. I'm on. Maybe you just go closer. Maybe go closer. Oh, is that better? Oh, barely. They can't hear anything. We can't hear anything. Okay. I mean, I had the red light on, so. Do they all work? Or none of them work? Hello? Can you hear me? <laughs> Testing. Not really. They're working on it. They're working on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that works. Anybody want to sing Ryan's film, Cowboy? They will. Got it? Yeah. No, I can hear me now. Sean. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So yeah. back to, we have a motion and a second that the agenda for February 2nd, 2021 be approved as submitted. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? And motion carries. Public hearing on the. I think it's the right page. For the school safety and district emergency response plan update. Yeah, so we'll uh, turn it over to Mrs. Gregory, our assistant superintendent for human resources. Uh, this is a requirement uh, to have a district wide safety plan public hearing. We do this usually in the summer. Um, but uh, Ms. Gregory will talk a little bit about why we're doing it again. We have to do an update to it. Thank you. Um, so we were asked to update our safety plan to include planning for a pandemic um, situation where we may have to close down the schools. And in the event that we did, we needed to identify certain individuals that we would state were essential employees and needed to be on, in the workplace or at work or working remotely. We also needed to speak to some of the areas of how we would provide um, remote instruction, how we would provide a safety plan if there were a pandemic situation, protocol for working hours, and a variety of other topics. So part of this required us to um, work with our union leadership to talk to them about our plan, to make sure that they were in agreement and understanding what was involved in that and who we had identified as the essential employees. Um, we needed to do that by, I think, February 7th. We did complete that. Um, and we are re recommending that we move forward with these um, addendums to the plan. Um, we talked about the essential employees. We talked about how we have upgraded our technology accessibility for families and for employees. We have um, provided all kinds of safety protocols with our personal protective equipment that we have a supply of that available to disseminate as needed. And we looked at any need for adjustment to hours for employees, although we did not think we would need to do that. And I think that was the main areas. Was there anything else, Dan? Or on the no, I think uh, this was new legislation uh, as a part of the district-wide safety plans. Like Dr. Putnam mentioned, we have to approve over the summer. Um, this required amendment was originally supposed to be approved by September 7th, uh, but with all of the frenzy of uh, reopening plans that closely mirrored a communicable disease scenario, uh, the legislature pushed, pushed it off until April 1st. So because we're amending the safety plan and the original safety plan is subject to that 30-day public comment period, uh, that's why we're bringing it to you tonight so we can have 30 days before the March 23rd mm -hmm. um, meeting to get it approved by April 1st. But Barb had all of the ac uh, actual items listed. 
I think it's fair just to add that it's it's all districts in New York State. This is uh, this is one of those done to us. Um, <laughs> so we're uh, we're doing it. Then I sat in with Barb in the vast majority of meetings with our collective bargaining groups just to go through the plan. Um, but thank you, Barb and Dan. So the next slide is the hearing is now open to public comment pertaining to the district-wide safety plan. Additionally, residents who wish to comment on the plan may email or call the district clerk, Sharon Erkfitz, and her email and phone number are there by March 4th. Okay. Are there any comments? And again, you, as Tom said, you can comment for until. I do have a comment, please. So you'll come down here. Uh, right at there's a microphone there yep and then you just for public comment you just have to state your name and address I appreciate what each and every one of you have done for this school district I know that I'm sorry could intent. you just state your name and address I don't want to thank you though. that's part of public comment yeah. okay my name is Fen. thank you but I do appreciate what each and every one of you have done for this district I know it's in your heart to do the right thing what I think Myself and a lot of other people in this district feel that our children haven't been put first. You've covered two or three slides already and you've, you've covered your, your butts. And you've said, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna cover X, Y, and Z. What I haven't heard is what are we gonna do about these kids that aren't in school? That's the number one thing. How are we gonna educate our children? That's what I uh, want to hear me. from you tonight. This, 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 we, there's a separate public comment period for, uh, for general public comment. This I period. appreciate that, but I don't know if we're going to get to that. I don't know what you're, you, well, you're, 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 you're going to cut me up. off. All right, let there, me explain. There's an agenda. There's okay. an agenda. I appreciate your agenda, but this whole meeting was called so that we could get to the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter no, is no, this. how are we going to educate our children, right? That's what you guys are, educators. Th this is Can a, you th please educate our children All right let me explain Please. let me explain how the, the meeting is going to be arranged today uh, we have an agenda and you can have a copy of it we have this legally required public hearing thank you that but we are in this is what i see on no, cnn I'm, please let me Great. finish thank you thank you for your effort All right. Not really appreciated. yeah we're going to have just so everyone knows we will have a we are in this public hearing for the uh, school safety and, and district emergency response and as part of our agenda we have uh, additional um, topics that come up and we will have a place for visitor speaking time it will be coming up after a few more items at which time people can and have people have submitted a request to speak and then they have time to speak on any topic they choose so so and again, is there any further comments specifically related to the school safety and district emergency response? Okay, seeing no, I call that that hearing is closed at 7.14 p.m. And we will return to our regular business. All right, so it is the approval of the consent agenda and it's a, at this time it would be recommended that the board approve the following consent agenda the approval of the minutes of january 19th 2021 as submitted the acceptance of the recommendations from the committee on special education the acceptance on the recommendations from the committee on special education the acceptance of the recommendations from the superintendent on personnel changes and the request to approve the recommended bidders that are in your agenda May I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? All right, motion carries. So now we are at our special reports and Dr. Putnam is gonna provide a special report. Actually, we will do it together, but I'll let Dr. Putnam start off. Thank you. So this evening we have a special report the Penfield Central School District COVID-19 overview and mid-year updates. Um, I do just want Mark to mention, I, I know we had a speaker who um, 
didn't let us know his address, but just for everybody watching at home and here, this is a, this is a standard board meeting. So this wasn't a special meeting called. This is a, a board meeting, and we're glad you came out in a, in a snowy day to, to speak to us and to speak to the board. Um, but this is, a lot has changed uh, since January, especially with some announcements from the state. And so we wanted to provide an update to our district as a whole uh, around our COVID-19 overview and mid-year updates. So I think, um, Mr. Elledge, you're gonna take uh, the first two slides. That is correct. So, you know, this COVID pandemic has impacted every aspect of our daily lives, including every aspect of our education system. And many of us are frustrated uh, and experiencing COVID fatigue. And I will just, you know, let everyone know that this board is made up of parents, they're made up of educators, and they're made up of business owners. So we've experienced this in every way and we are all working on this together to reach a common resolution. The district was required to beat the governor's executive orders as well as the guidance from not just the governor, but the New York State Department of Education, the New York State Department of Health, and the Monroe County Department of Health. So we had essentially four layers of requirements that we had to meet in order to reopen in the back in March or thereabouts. So we had to, and we had to reconfigure most of our instructional models and typical systems to meet those requirements. And you know, we did that, and we did it in very short order, and we are committed to getting our students back to school in a safe and supportive manner. Now, to help everyone understand how the, we're with the current state and what happens is, this is a very transient situation. We get changes from uh, the governor quite frequently, uh, changes in the rules, changes in what's acceptable, and of course changes as a result of the infection rates in our county. So to keep everyone aware of where we are today, we have dedicated web pages for the COVID updates and information. We, and all our reopening plans and guidances are posted on the website. And these are reopening plans had to be approved by the state. Uh, and regular emails are sent to families and posted on the website. We've had several parent surveys and we, every, almost every board meeting, I'd say every board meeting, has had a COVID update where we talk about some aspect of COVID and how it's affecting us and what, and what we're doing, what's changing, what we're learning. You know, sometimes we talk about the survey results, sometimes we talk about you know, other situations. And on top of that, this is discussed at the PTA and PAB meetings, and those are attended by at least one member, one representative from the board. So you know, we have discussions with the parents at the PTAs and the PABs where we can let's talk, hear from them and they can hear from us as to what is going on. In addition to that, there are weekly meetings with the superintendent between the, the county superintendents and the Monroe County Department of Health. So there's, there's a, this, is, this dominates this year and there has been no shortage of activity and a goal to Get us, in the, get us as close as we can to full time in a safe manner that is allowable in accordance with the guidelines and restrictions that we have. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, we are actually, as of yesterday, uh, halfway through this 2020-2021 school year. So I just want to take some time to, to say, where, where have we been? So uh, it feels like a year ago, because it was, that uh, Monday, March 16th, Penfield Central School District was moved to remote instruction by, at that time, the Monroe County uh, 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 Executive and, um, and uh, Department of Health. So all school district in Monroe County went um, uh, all remote on March 16th, Monday. Um, the statewide move, the governor made an executive order that shut all schools down throughout the state on uh, Wednesday, March 18th. So at that time when we closed, as a reminder uh, to the board, we were not a one-to-one -one device district. We had a three-year plan to get there and COVID hit and we were not a one-to-one -one device district. So not every student had devices. Not every student at home and many of our families were lacking Wi-Fi and home devices. Our faculty and staff, part of this reopening plan that we just talked about is that back in the spring, based on the executive order from the governor, faculty and staff, most staff, weren't even allowed to be in the building. They couldn't come in per executive order. And so our, we shifted our remote learning plans twice, learned a great deal, 
as a superintendent and a parent, I'm not writing a book on how the spring was when it comes to remote learning. It was um, not where we wanted to be and we learned quite a lot on what we needed to do if we're gonna move forward. So um, the impact of COVID all spring, we expedited our plans to become a one-to-one -one district. We uh, put a three-year plan into place in eight months. So I can't say enough about our director of technology, Mr. Jason DeLorenz and his entire team as well as our families and school staff that within eight months, we were a one-to-one -one district. We would have been a one-to-one -one district sooner, but believe it or not, most districts in New York State weren't a one-to-one -one district and most districts in the nation weren't, so everybody tried to buy computers at the same time. The reason it took eight months is because we had to wait for boats to come from overseas to deliver laptops. Uh, we focused on social emotional learning for students during the rem remote learning. We focused on critical content, clear expectations and consistency. We realized we needed a single platform. We were trying to use multiple platforms and because we weren't a one-to-one -one district and we landed on Microsoft 365 Teams, which we knew would be our single platform moving into any sort of um, remote learning we would do in the future. We had to do a tremendous amount of professional development and curriculum redesigns for our remote and hybrid setting uh, that we knew we might be heading into. The impact still goes on in the spring as we were required to shift to remote instruction by an executive order of the governor. The governor provided, sometimes I think it's, it's easy to look back and go, um, well, well, why didn't we do X, Y, or Z? It's a reminder to the board and to the community that when we closed in March, the governor provided an extension to the executive order every two weeks. I'll be honest with you, the first few weeks, everybody in Monroe County thought, okay, we'll be back in, we'll be closed for two weeks, we'll be closed for four weeks, and then we're coming back. Um, and, and so there was never a decision until the last two weeks of June that we weren't coming back. And obviously we all remember that. I think our high school uh, went leaps and bounds with incredible parents in the bash and senior committees to find ways to celebrate our seniors uh, who had to uh, graduate under COVID rules. There was a great deal in the spring of political disagreements outside of this uh, area of Penfield about the impact of COVID. And so we left districts waiting for a return to schools, which never happened. In May 2020, the governor announced reopening guidance would be released, and he said it would come in June. The reopening guidance uh, was released in mid-July, and a requirement was given that all districts in New York State would have to submit plans to reopen in September by July 31st. So we had a two week turnaround to put plans together. The reopening documents and requirements came from New York State. Then the next day came from New York State Department of Education, followed by New York State Department of Health, followed by the Monroe County Department of Health. All of those reopening guidance documents are on our COVID webpage where they've been since this summer. Reopening requirements were required, uh, were reviewed by legal counsel, and many FAQ documents were created to help guide districts. Uh, FAQs from SED, from uh, the Department of Health in the state, and the Department of Health uh, locally. The requirements to reopen schools were strict, and they still are. The major hurdle was six feet of social distancing in classrooms and lunchrooms, as well as 12 feet of social distancing for musical performances. The final guidance included requirements for masks and social distancing. There's lots of misinformation out there based on what the CDC may have said, based on what the original opening guidance was in July. By the time we got to August, in, in all of our reopening plans, if you look at those online, they are questions that we have to, we have to answer. There's one for the district and there's one for each of our six schools. And in all of those, it's an and. I, I, I wish it was an or, but it's an and, and legal counsel was involved across Monroe County and the state for that. We were also required to offer 100% virtual option in addition to the hybrid option. So school districts across the state are basically running two separate school districts under one title. We have a hybrid and we have a 100% virtual. Uh, due to the social distancing requirements through the winter and the fall, we reopened with a hybrid version and a 100% virtual model. District was fully one-to-one -one by Thanksgiving when all the computers came in, lots of, uh, lots of people hours to get those computers in the hands and uh, Wi-Fi uh, devices to families who needed uh, to be able to connect at home. Analysis and planning for the possibility of returning students on alternating Wednesdays began in early December. 
So we started working in December around what we needed to do to get kids back potentially on Wednesdays. We had a hope and a desire to be able to roll that out for the second semester, which is this week. That didn't happen. Transportation schedule. I'm going to talk a little bit about why it didn't happen right away. Is the transportation schedule. So right now, um, our bus drivers are incredible, and they are driving buses on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. On Wednesday, we are still transporting students in out-of-district placements and for students with disabilities in out-of-district placements. So there are drivers who may be driving one route Monday and Tuesday, Thursday and Friday, but a completely different route Wednesday. We can't flip the switch and say, hey, you're driving your regular schedule for Monday and Tuesday on Wednesday as well because their, their routes don't line up, their schedules don't line up. We're working on that right now. We have been working on that. It's not impossible, <laughs> but it takes time to reschedule. It takes us about two to three months to do full routing of all of our students in the district, and we're trying to do it in the middle of a school year. Not impossible, but that's the reality. Instructional scheduling, especially K-5, we're running virtual and we're running hybrid. So one of the issues that we've been trying to work through, and I, our building principals and our directors are working uh, to, to make this happen, is that the one example I can give you, and there's lots of these, is that our virtual students are receiving their specials on Wednesdays because there aren't as many students in the building. Students in our 1211 program are able to go on Wednesdays. So what we have now is if students are going to be back in on Wednesday, all of those special area teachers, uh, music and art and PE, they're going to have to teach sections of kids from, from cohort A or B. And so that means they can't offer any specials to our 100% virtual students. So not impossible, but I can't take away from our virtual students in order to give something to the hybrid students. We have to find a way to make it work for everybody. The other piece is our 100% virtual teachers at K-5 are from all four of our elementary buildings. So in a typical year, I might be able to say, hey, let's make this happen. All four elementary principals, figure out your schedule all by yourself and do it. it they don't have to be exact. Because we have virtual teachers from all four schools teaching students from all four schools, the uh, schedules for all four elementaries have to be lockstep. Again, not impossible, but it's taking us time and longer than we expected. There's also needs of students, faculty, and staff. We've got to make sure that staff does have their contractual obligations filled. We have to make sure that students are getting their PT, their OT, their special education services, um, and speech services. So we just have to find a way to make sure that we can do this, and it basically is rescheduling our entire elementary school schedule. And so that is taking time, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. On January 22nd, as all this is happening, the governor, it's a Friday, 3 p.m., and the governor announces, I learned via tweet, that high-risk athletics may resume with local district uh, Department of Health approval. So as the board knows, at about 3.30, by tweet, the Monroe County Department of Health uh, says that they fully approve and support um, high-risk sports. So away we go, and questions uh, begin immediately. If high-risk sports can start, what about music? What about performing arts? What about clubs like robotics? And what about in-person instruction five days a week? So as of today, there has been no new guidance uh, released about anything except athletics. So for example, we hear that high-risk sports are gonna be uh, supported. I understand it. They're great for our students at the middle school and high school. They're incredible for social emotional learning. They're incredible for students' physical activity. But we have lots of other kids who don't play sports that also wanna have more. And while that is approved, no guidance from the state, the Department of Health, SED, has come out saying um, what you need to do to get more kids back in school or how can you uh, shift back to a more normal school year. So what needs to change? So since August 2020, districts uh, and everybody in the community, thanks to the media, has been given updated metrics for when we're going to have to shift to remote instruction. We know we, this started with a infection rate. As soon as your region's infection rate hit a certain point, you're going to have to move to um, a fully remote. Then it uh, became colorful, and we had yellow zones and orange zones and red zones. And what we had to do, uh, Penfield was designated a yellow zone. We uh, did our testing that we had to do in the yellow zone before Thanksgiving break. 
and we stepped up to every single mandate. We tested in yellow, we were, came back, those testing that we did prior to that was 20% of our school population, staff and students, and we were less than a 0.5% infection rate before Thanksgiving. So while the metrics for a required move to remote instruction shifted all fall and winter, they became stricter and stricter and stricter, and then just last week they all went away. Um, there are no metrics for a full reopening. So districts do have to follow the state uh, executive orders, the mandates from the governor, the guidance from the Department of Health, SED, and our local Department of Health. And we have, have not, as districts or communities, have any metrics on what we need to have in place in order to come back more fully. We have no metrics in place for what we have to do to maybe come back with three feet distance instead of six feet distance, and this is an area that needs to change. So current issues to be addressed. Um, the governor made a comment, it became a soundbite, I've heard all about it, I watched it, that it was a local decision for school districts. The required guidance and mandates have not changed. I've heard since then that what he's referring to is school districts across the state that are 100% virtual. Um, we are in a hybrid model, but it's not a local decision because the guidance has to change for us to do anything different um, when, in terms of the six foot distance. Districts need revised guidance from New York State, from SED, New York State Department of Health in order to update reopening plans and then submit them for state approval. Mark mentioned earlier that we are operating under our reopening plans approved by the state. So in order to do anything different when it comes to how many students we have in a classroom, the distancing, the masking, they would need to be reapproved by the state and we have no new guidance or way to submit any new plans. So the vaccinations for dis district staff need to be an increase significantly. I don't have any control, nor do any of us, over the vaccination. I know the Department of Health is doing the best they can with the supply they have. But I want to give you an example because even though all school staff, bus drivers, anybody that works for a school district is considered part of 1B, the second tier of the rollout for the vaccinations in New York State, um, we have had four days of uh, school staff only uh, vaccinations scheduled by Monroe uh, uh, County Department of Health. Three last week and one tomorrow. Each day they release a link that goes to superintendents across, um, across the county, uh, public school superintendents and leaders of all the private schools. And then we forward that link on around four o'clock and there's about 300, there are 300 or, today, or tomorrow 295 spots to try to cover over 30,000 school related uh, employees in the county. So as of tomorrow, we'll have had about 1,200 vaccinations to try to get one to every one of the 30,000 plus staff members. So vaccinations are here. We know they're coming. There's light at the end of the tunnel, um, but, but we do need to have staff more uh, uh, vaccinated, at least the option to vaccinate, and that needs to significantly change. So the question really is, is, is what is the safest path forward? Um, we know that we have guidance that says we have to follow the New York State guidance on how we reopen and what does that look like? And then on the same side, we've got to make sure that what we're doing is safe and uh, the medical experts in Monroe County and New York State would approve those plans. So districts need clear guidance on how and when we can safely reopen with less distancing. An example is, uh, we're going to be starting an advocacy uh, push within our district and we'll be asking families who are interested to join us is uh, I I'm not going to be advocating for a full return to school. I am going to be advocating for the metrics on when we can have a full return to school. So maybe one of the examples is a low infection rate in schools. We've tested for the last two weeks, voluntary testing for parents who are interested in having their students tested and any staff that was interested. We've done about 10% of our in-person uh, folks. And uh, our infection rate over the last two we weeks was 0.16%. Uh, so uh, far under a 1% infection rate in our school. A community vaccination rate. I have a question mark there. I don't know what that is, but if there is going to be a Monroe County or New York State or Governor Executive Order saying what the vaccination rate has to be in order to go back to a full return, more typical school year, tell us what it is and let us work towards it. Um, other data points that could be collected by the state, the county, or the district. That's all of the metrics on why we had to close were based on infection rates that are declining in our region, hospitalization rates that are declining in our region. So what is the magic number to come back to school more fully? 
And then a combined advocacy effort is going to be critically important as we have new assembly people uh, in our area representing us and being able to advocate as a collective group of the community, the district, the board on what we need to do in order to um, get the guidance in place. Yes, and, and this advocacy is done, uh, Dr. Putnam as a superintendent with the Superintendent's Association and the board does it in conjunction with the Monroe County School Board Association and the New York State School Board Association. And, and what's really nice is we have a very strong school board association in Monroe County. They're highly respected in the state and we have meetings with our legislative representatives and we talk to them about many things and we always have, but this year it is about this very topic. So we are trying to get these things that will allow us to go open full time, or at least again, the metrics that we can, we can use as targets to get us open full time and we will continue to do so. But so that's what we're doing. You know, you can still advocate as well and, and talk to your representatives, which are the same ones, and talk to the governor uh, to say the same thing. You know, it's the more voices, the better. And Thanks, Mark. I think that, you know, one of those pieces is really, I want to be fair and honest too, is that while I have received emails about a full return to school, I've received emails about please be safe with my students and please be safe with staff. So. Again, I'm not a health <coughs> expert. We're going to follow all the guidance they give us. We're going to meet all of the legal executive orders and mandates from all of those groups that, that we do report to. Um, but at the end of the day, what we want is to, to return students in a safe and sustainable manner, something that's going to be able to last in a way that we don't have to return to a remote setting. Um, and again, these are some examples of the advocacy. We're working on that now with superintendent groups, with Monroe County School Boards, and within our own district on what we should be asking for um, to make sure that we know what we have to hit. Give us the marks, we'll make sure we need to hit that. They do that for everything else in the state. They tell us what our graduation rate needs to be. They tell us what our scores on Regents exams need to be. They tell us what the benchmark for 338 testing is. So tell us what we need to do to get kids back, and we will work to make that happen. So next steps. Uh, we will be increasing in-person instructional time for students K-12 by alternating Wednesdays. Staff learned that today in an email, uh, and I'm sharing it for the first time with the community and the board's aware of that. We are going to also be having to work at increasing synchronous instructional time for students attending the 100% virtual model. Um, although the majority of our students are in a hybrid version, we're required to have a virtual model as well, and we want to make sure that whatever we're doing, there's fairness and equity uh, between both. So having students attend on Wednesdays by cohort does have an impact, and I already talked a little bit about this, around transportation schedules, instructional schedules, the K-5 specials, student services, curriculum timelines. Our directors and teacher leaders worked all summer to revise all of our uh, curriculum apps to make sure that we're going to hit all of the core content, uh, even in a hybrid model. And so, again, it just takes some time. We want to make sure that if we're bringing kids back on Wednesdays, every other Wednesday, that we have a plan in the curriculum to make sure that we're staying focused on that essential to know. We do believe that in-person time is going to far outweigh um, um, asynchronous learning and we're going to do everything we can and I'm mentioning now or sharing now that this is our plan the question is when is it going to happen and it's going to be uh, I will know more in two weeks so the goal is before February break which is less than two weeks away if not before February break the day at we get back that I can share uh, the date for starting Wednesdays and uh, that February break, although all of our children will be off enjoying themselves, I hope, um, we are still working to try to finalize all plans and make sure that if we say we're going to do it on X date, that we're going to do it. We're going to therefore be continuing to troubleshoot and create solutions to return K-12 students on alternating Wednesdays. Right. That is the end of my special report and Mark's special report. Uh, typically at the end of special reports, we do ask for questions from board members. So board members, any questions or comments? Uh, I have a comment. Catherine? Um, just to build up of your um, point about the ad advocacy, um, the legislative committee is meeting this week, mm -hmm. this Thursday, uh, with our new representatives. So that'll be it's a very welcome and long overdue meeting and we're all looking forward to letting them know the kind of challenges we're facing here. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up in just two days. Thank you. Other board members? Okay, so one thing I just wanted to also point out that 
um, you know, kind of said explicitly, even though Tom spoke to it, is we really run three schools concurrently right now. Mm -hmm. We are running a full 100 virtual school, so we have to, from K through 12, so we have to have staffing and curriculum to manage that. We're running the hybrid schools, and then we're running a full in-person school for students that have specific needs that merit that. So, you know, there, there's many, many moving parts, far more than it normally occurs during, uh, in, in a normal operation of our school. So it, it, everything gets much more complicated when Dr. Putnam talks about trying to coordinate all these things and the schedules and the logistics. It, it's not just doing it in the normal environment. It's doing an environment where we're running three schools at once with the finite amount of faculty, the finite amount of space and resources. Mark, I, I appreciate you mentioning the, the space piece because I, I do think it's important and the board is aware that there are districts in the county for K-5 who are able to find a way to get kids five days a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, Penfield and a number of others could not. And we've, it's funny, you look back at our, at our board meetings over the last five years when our former uh, deputy superintendent, uh, uh, Dr. Sansusi, talked about enrollment and how across the county they were seeing declining enrollment and Penfield continued to grow. And so we have business, uh, we have a capital project that's in the works and starting to come to an end of adding uh, 12 classrooms district-wide to our K-5 buildings. Our class sizes, as our community knows, we're pushing 24, 25, 26, and sometimes 27 in an elementary classroom. In order to get uh, elementary students into a classroom with six feet of distance, the average we can have in there is 11 to 12. And we did all the measurements and, and, and tried to squeeze it out. We moved half of our furniture in this district into Verde trailers to make the room to get that distance that we, that we were required to have. And so even if we utilized our gyms, our cafeterias, our music rooms, and our art room, it still wouldn't come close to the amount of space we would need in order to bring K-5 kids back full time that space issue is compo compounded at the middle school and high school level. And so we want nothing more than to be able to, to, to close our eyes, wake up, and just be able to go back to normal. Our staff wants it, our faculty wants it, um, everybody wants that because it's quite honestly easier to teach and obviously easier to learn if you're in school five days a week. Um, and we're going to get there. We need the metrics to know what we need to do, and we will uh, uh, meet any metric that we're required to do uh, from the state in order to do that. So this advocacy push is going to be important. This isn't new advocacy. The Monroe County Superintendents Group has been asking. We meet with the Department of Health on a weekly basis, typically. We meet with uh, Monroe County leadership. We have been asking for this, um, but the fact that high-risk sports were approved at the state level, I think, was the, the catalyst to say this doesn't make sense anymore. I can't explain it. I'm, I'm being very honest in, in that I can't explain why we can have high-risk sports, but we can't get more kids into the building. Um, so that's what we need to understand and we need those metrics in order to be able to uh, meet the needs of all of our students and try to look at getting back. I think the Wednesdays is obviously a start. Uh, we're working through all of those pieces now. We did have a plan, I'll be honest, and the board is aware that maybe we could have done Wednesdays with more virtual. And what I heard from many stakeholders, we didn't do a survey on this, but we reviewed the survey from November, is more virtual wasn't going to work. What we want is in-person time. The hybrid families want in-person time, not more virtual work. And so um, that concludes the special report, Mark, and unless there's other board questions, Board members? All right, thank you, Dr. Putnam. You're welcome. I did get a request to, to switch two items on the agenda. Uh, our student representative, uh, Abby Jockerman, needs uh, is somewhat time constrained, and we'd like to flip, without objection, flip that in the public speaking time to let her go first so she can go and do what students do. <laughs> All right, okay. Abby? Uh, Hello everybody, it is that time again. Um, at Penfield High School in the Robotics Club, Team 1511 wished all of its past mentors a happy mentoring month and four students were accepted to attend the 2021 All Eastern Virtual Conference. At Bay Trail, Mr. Praise Class used bowling balls in a physics demonstration. And at Indian Landing, on January 28th, students celebrated the power of positivity by wearing purple. Simon was also wearing purple. 
and at cobbles, students who played wind instruments were working on not looking at their hands while switching notes, and one student went all out and put on their reindeer pajamas, which had a hood that automatically covered their eyes. <laughs> and at Scribner, a group of students made snowmen at recess, and I'm sure that there will be more due to the <laughs> huge amount of snow we've gotten today. And there was another pancake breakfast at Don's Original, dedicated to the Scribner staff. And at Harris Hill, Ms. Staub was working with students to help uh, connect perspective taking with empathy and social emotional learning lessons. And, kid and kindergartners learned lessons about bullying. And lastly, for district wide news, on January 7th, it was International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And schools took a few moments to reflect upon the importance of remembering and the consequences of forgetting. Mm -hmm. February is Black History Month. And from February 1st to the 5th, it is National School Counseling Week. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Abby. Board members, any questions for Abby? Great. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. So Thanks, Abby. <coughs> okay. Which brings us to uh, visitor speaking time. This is designated. This is the designated time for district residents to bring their comments to the board. The board encourages residents to share their opinions, voice concerns, and offer suggestions in a constructive atmosphere. Matters involving particular individuals or speci the specifics of negotiations are not permitted during public session and should be addressed privately with the board president or the superintendent. Comments brought to the board will be taken under consideration. However, this is not a time when the board can answer questions or engage in dialogue. A request to speak form must be filled out prior to the start of the meeting and given to the district clerk. Speakers are expected to identify themselves with their full name and address before presenting and limit their comments to five minutes or less. The board president reserves the right to limit the total amount of visitor speaking time based on the length of the agenda and the number of participants. Written communications to the board are always encouraged. So we do have some and we have them in order which I think they were received. The first one be Nicole uh, Berdoulis or Berdalis. Hello, good evening. Um, I just wanted to speak tonight and thank you guys for everything that you have done and to kind of reiterate and um, remind everybody that parents choose the Penfield School District because of the fantastic reputation, quality education, and leadership who helps to shape the school district to be the best that it can be. Um, I think the consensus when I've spoke with parents around town um, is that we all want like leadership that has a can-do attitude and that kind of thinks outside of the box. Um, so we're hoping that that, you know, is something that, that is definitely, you know, going on behind the scenes when you guys are having your meetings. Um, one thing that we also kind of wonder that w as we've been speaking together is how come we're being directed, you know, in, a, in an email to contact the governor when it's a form that we all know that he doesn't even answer or somebody in his office isn't answering. I think that was a little bit, um, a little bit of a disappointment. Um, it's just confusing, which I appreciate Dr. Putnam, you know, kind of elaborating in his um, slide tonight that you guys are kind of just like waiting for the guidance. Um, how about instead of just like waiting, you present something to them. I don't even know if that's something that you guys can do, but maybe think outside and kind of you set the precedence of, of what it can be with the infection rate in our schools locally. Um, we're kind of looking to maybe have like more of an update on a weekly basis perhaps or even bi-weekly. Um, I don't feel that maybe I lose track of time. I, I don't feel that we get that many updates um, recently of what's going on. Like of course how you collaborated to come up with the plan and present it, yes you know, we can go back on the website and look at all of that information, but more so like an update so that we know the transparency of like, what, it, what are you guys presenting to these leaders that you have to wait on the information? Um, just kind of so that we know like more of what's going on. And, and I think that's would be very, you know, people would be very happy with that, the parents. Um, and, you know, the school districts that have been able to, to reopen fully, I don't know all the measurements. It's, you know, I, I have faith that you guys are being transparent with that, but 
how did they do it and how come we can't do it? I do know that Pittsburgh has similar class sizes that we do. I don't know what their square footage is and things like that, but those are just kind of like some of the things that I've taken away when I speak with other parents. Um, so thank you again, and you know, if we could just have a little bit more transparency, I think we'd all be a little bit happier. Great. Well, thank you. And the next speaker would be <laughs> the next speaker would be Jessica O'Connor. Hi, everybody. I'm Jessica O'Connor. Um, I don't want to share my address if that's okay with the public. We can't hear you. We can't. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Do you need my address publicly, or is that okay? Yeah, you have a name there? and address, please. Oh, okay. Um, Jessica O'Connor, 33 Hollybrook Drive. Um, most of you know me because um, I've worked alongside you guys as a PTA president and a member of the Parent Advisory Board um, and a partner with all of you, you know, for many years. Um, I think like you, the reason I do what I do for the district, what I have done is because I have a passion for these, this community, these, these students, and I know you all do too, and that's why most of you are up there. Um, it was a shock to myself as well as a lot of people when um, back in August we opted to remove our children from the district and send them all to private schools uh, for full-time in-school education. I sat on a meeting every week since March as part of the Parent Advisory Board with Dr. Putnam um, and all the PTA presidents in, in the area um, where we tried to advocate as best we could for what families needed in this district. That advocacy didn't you know, end up working out the way um, I think it should have. Um, there was a, a, a survey given to parents in July and that was not, the results of that survey were not shared with the public but I obtained it from Dr. Putnam. 75% of parents believed that in-person learning full-time was the right decision. 7% believed that hybrid was the proper solution. So when a, a district comes out with a hybrid plan for 7% of its constituents, it was, hard, it was a hard thing to see. But people have been patient, and the reason they've been patient is because everybody is trying their best. We're in a pandemic, and this is a really, really hard time. Everybody's you know, worn out and tired and putting their best foot forward. I think people have been waiting and hoping that this district has been moving towards a little bit more in-person education, and it is very you know, um, encouraging to see that they've decided to you know, go forth with the Wednesdays. Um, but I'm sorry, I lost my place. All the while we've been doing this, we have been watching other districts in the same state that have the same requirements as Penfield come up with creative and innovative solutions to get their kids into schools. My son's school has implemented the use of barriers in classrooms um, and to, to, enhance social distance, um, to enhance social distancing, get people in the classrooms and help with socialization. My daughter's school rented an entire new school building for their middle school so all their middle school students could attend full time. There's a district in Long Island, it's called Belmore Merrick School District. They're very similar geographically to Penfield. 6,000 students, very crowded also. All of their children, K through 12, have been in schools full time since September 25th with the use of barriers around desks. And furthermore, they've had intramurals, clubs, and performing arts going on that whole time. And that's a lot of districts on Long Island, and I know that's a different part of the state. So looking at Rochester area, there are 17 districts I know of that have their K through five students in full time. Eight of them have their K through 12 students in full time. Pittsburgh is one of them, as uh, Dr. Putnam mentioned, East Irondequoit, and they are updating their plans. If you go to these websites, you see an updated plan that they're, they're sending off to the state um, as they change. Wheatland Chile is bringing people back, Hilton and Williamson. So people are doing things, coming up with creative ways to, to do it. Um, you'd think it would be more dangerous with the use of barriers, um, which has, by the way, been accepted by the SED. If you look at the guideline that the SED put out in their FAQ document, they define social distancing as six feet or the use of barriers. And that's what they're doing to, to do it. But it's actually not more dangerous. I look at the COVID-19 um, report card on the, on the state website, and the same percentage of students are, and staff are contracting COVID in Belmore Merrick School District as they are in Penfield, and all their kids are in school. Um, so I think how they're getting it done is that they're coming together as a community and they're rallying and they're using creativity and innovation to get the job done. I think we've seen people do things this year that we never thought they could do. 
I think Penfield's an incredible district. I think we can do really hard things, and I think our, our district deserves, our kids deserve our best. So I'm here to advocate for that, and I'm really encouraged to see this advocacy that um, you know, you're, you're inviting parents into. I think it is exactly you know, what parents have been asking for, a transparency, a relationship. I think that the district has relied on PAB for a long time, the Parent Advisory Board, as their portal into the parent community. And I'm not necessarily sure that that's an accurate representation of all the parents. I've spent a lot of time talking to parents over the last um, year. A lot of parents have reached out to me. I think parents are nervous in this district. We're a quiet district. I think they trust Penfield quite a bit. Um, and the parents really worry about saying something that might rock the boat or seem unappreciative of everything everybody's doing. Um, but we need to be partners. You know, everybody in this community, we fund 68% of the district budget and our voices matter. Um, we could help solve those challenges. We have a lot of ideas. I know I'm getting close to my five minutes, I'm sorry. Um, there are 200 people in a Facebook group right now that started a Penfield advocacy group, a lot of whom are sitting behind me here today. And in a snowstorm, I think this is a pretty good turnout. Um, it's unfortunate that it has to be that they had to come to the board meeting to be able to, to get your ear. I know a lot of them have reached out individually. Um, you know, I, I do think more of this kind of thing has to happen where you're, you're hearing from the community and what they, what they want. Um, they're ready to work with you, do anything it takes, you know, help raise funds if necessary. We have wonderful PTAs that are willing to chip in. Um, so I'm here today just not, you know, not for my kids because my kids are well taken care of and they are in wonderful schools and they're thriving. I'm here for every person here in uh, Penfield, you know, all these families that struggle through hybrid learning. It's not ideal for anyone. I'm here for the, the families that have left the district that are yearning to come back because they love it. Um, I just ask you to please, you know, be transparent and work with the community. And um, I think that get, getting our kids in school is the thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker is Lauren Luft. And again, please state your name and address. Yes, my name is Lauren Luft, and I'm at 2123 Baird Road. I'm here today as a concerned parent, not just for my child's right to a proper education, but out of concern for her social, emotional well-being. Uh, I think the parents of the Penfield School District feel underinformed from the district. I was happy that I was able to come tonight, even through the snowstorm, to get a good understanding of where you guys are at, because I don't feel like that's been properly communicated up until this point. It was really refreshing to see that you guys are actively working on Getting Back Wednesdays. Um, I'm here to advocate for a full return in the fall, which I know you guys want too. Um, and I know that you guys are relying on metrics. And I think that together with the parents and the teachers and everyone who wants answers, we can definitely achieve that in the fall. Um, but it's gonna have to take more than just the testing and those metrics that you guys are doing right now. You're gonna have to look at other districts and what other districts are doing and really look at the fine print and even consult with those lawyers about that verbiage because we're able to read it too, like you said. All the documents are online. Partitions, transparent plastic barriers are a substitute for social distancing. So the fact that you guys can't fit everyone in the building is false. Okay, please consult with your lawyers on that. You know, take it from the people. We're here telling you. And we know you guys are up here for a reason. Like, I'm looking at you. I voted for you. Like, I know, like, we know you guys are advocating for our kids. My fiance remembers you from high school, Dr. Putnam. Like, we know you're here for us, but we need you to do more. We need you to do more for our kids, because this isn't working out. We all know it's not working out for our kids right now. We've all kind of accepted, like, okay, across the board, they're gonna be behind academically, right? As hard of a pill as that is to swallow, we've all swallowed it. We want them back in the fall. We need to be doing more. It's now February. And there's only a plan, no offense, for coming back on Wednesdays. That should have been months ago, I think. And the reopening for fall should have been what we saw today. And I know you guys are committed, as are we, as are teachers, because when we have those conversations, when the parents come to the teachers, and I think we've grown closer this year than ever before, you know, they say, 
listen, our hands are tied, in other words. You know, we're doing the best we can. We're going to meet your child where they're at. You know, we, we get that. And what we're hearing from the teachers is that they don't, have, they don't know when they're going to return to in-person learning. No one knows. So we need to do better. We're here to help, too. If it's funding that's an issue for the plastic transparent barriers, we'll chip in. Like, I don't have that much money to spare, but I would, I would give some money to, for that if money's an issue. Like, we need to figure out a solution. We need to get these kids back in school. Uh, if not for the academic factor, then the social emotional well-being. This is really hard on families, really, really hard on working families, and even arguably discriminatory against those who can't afford to pull their kids out of a district when they're already paying taxes and put them in public school to the tune of five, six, seven grand a year. It's really not fair. So let's even the playing field. Let's do better. Let's all come together here and just commit to getting our kids back in school for a full-time, five-day week education in the fall. I think that's totally doable. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next is Larissa, Larissa McCann Krupp. Again, please state your name and address. It's Larissa Macahon Krupp, 15 Sweets View Lane. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here wearing my parent hat this evening. I am an educator, 26 years. I have a daughter that began freshman year here at Penfield High School. I have a son who we ended up pulling out back in sixth or seventh grade, sent him to private school um, because of the implementation of Common Core. We wanted to give Penfield a chance for our daughter. I know that the bumps in the roads in Common Core, you know, have been handled and taken care of. My daughter couldn't wait to start high school this year, especially with, you know, her friends that she's made here in Penfield and what have you. Um, like I said, I'm a teacher at an elementary school in a local school district. I'm proud to say that I go to school each and every day in person you may not know this by my mask and everybody else, but I go in every day with a smile on my face, excited to be there for my students each and every day in person. I'm proud to be an educator. I'm proud to have my daughter attending here at Penfield, and I understand the situation that came to us back in March. But we need to consider the fact that we have to go forward we can't look backwards. We have to be proactive. I feel like a lot of, and it's not just this district here, I feel like it's many districts, including the one that I work at right now personally, that we tend in education to be reactive. We need to be proactive. That's what we need. We need to be looking forward. We need to put together an action plan. Not today, okay, not tomorrow, but it should have been done already months ago. We should have had several different options to take a look at as to how we can move fo forward in the decisions right now with our students. And as much as you know, I'd love to say and, and wave my magic wand for tomorrow to say, let's go back to in-person instruction, I understand that there's many obstacles and barriers. But I think as a community here, as a parent, as a taxpayer, teachers that I know that work in this district, you as board members, other officials here within the district, Dr. Putman, we need to do something together and it needs to happen now. And I like the fact, I love to hear that, you know, we're having an advocacy group and so forth that will be formulated. But I just, you know, I wish that this would have happened already months ago, like I said, to be proactive because our students deserve in-person instruction, in-person education. If I can do this with my students each and every day in the district that I work in, we need to be creative. We need to think outside of the box. And the students here in this district should have the same opportunity as the students in the district that I teach at right now. And we need to start looking at that. And we need to do it not, not as of you know yesterday. We need to start now. Because like I said, these students deserve to be in school in person. And I don't know if my daughter would like to come up and speak. Nope, but I mean. 
Go right ahead. No, she's fine. Okay. Anyhow, um, she speaks so many conversations, you know, at home and so forth, just talking about what her freshman year is like right now. And, um, you know, it's great. It's great that we're talking about sports moving forward and what have you, but the goal and purpose is education first, okay? A lot of those other secondary things can happen, but we want our children in school each and every day. Let's make it happen, please. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And finally, we have Marcy Hart. You actually already addressed my issues, so I'm all set. I'm sorry? You already addressed my issues, so I'm all set. She's all set. Okay. Her issue has been addressed. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. All right. So I'd just like to thank everybody. Thank you for coming out and thank to speak. And thank you for the folks who came to support them. And we understand and that you're, advo you're advocating for your students and we, um, you know, we support that and we encourage that. So thank you for coming out, especially on a snowy day like today. Next, we will get to the superintendent's report. Dr. Putnam. So uh, yeah, this evening I'm gonna have to gonna have to find Abby and let her know because her her presentation is always so much better than mine. But uh, she did a nice <laughs> job talking about student and staff honors across our district. Uh, so we'll do a few of those. We do have some updates uh, around our in-person testing, uh, our sorry, our um, voluntary COVID testing as well as transportation plans. Uh, budget development updates to for uh, Dr. Driffle, as well as our secret presentation by Dr. Driffle, and then Mr. Pfeiffer will be discussing our professional learning plan update. So, uh, very exciting. We have incredible uh, talent here in our district, and congratulations to PHS students Anna Young, John Healy, and Ethan Van Houten, who have been accepted to the All Eastern Mix Chorus and Emily uh, Klemchik, who was accepted into the All Eastern Band. So they're all there, and you can tell that they're all smiling <laughs> underneath their masks. But uh, great, incredible musicians we have. Uh, including uh, visual arts, uh, the work of several Penfield High School students, artists, will be featured in an upcoming RIT virtual art show. The show will be live on uh, Beaver Gallery website as of Friday, February 12th. And students who win awards will also be featured in a video. And so very cool. And I will, uh, once we get that link, we'll be able to share that out with uh, the board and um, uh, with our community online. New citizen, this is very, very cool, I think. And this is congratulations to our very own Mr. Aguilar, a cleaner at Harris Hill Elementary School who recently earned his United States citizenship. So I know he's not here, but round of applause would be wonderful. Um, he's, uh, I know that he um, is just it's very, very cool, and uh, I absolutely love that photograph, too, and um, That's great. Um, we're just very excited. Uh, he's a wonderful member of the Harris Hill family and, uh, and, a, and a district member, and we're um, very excited for that. Very cool. Uh, today is also National School, so this week is National School Counseling Week, and so just... Um, a reminder for the board and for the community is that school counselors are all in for all students and and I love that that's this year's model for National School Counseling Week because we talk about here around really being here for all students and we celebrate our student counselors this week to focus attention on the unique contribution of our counselors and highlight the tremendous impact school counselors have in helping students achieve social emotional well-being and academic success so just a huge thank you to all of our school counselors in the Penfield Center Central School District. I have a few um, updates I wanted to go through with the board. First is transportation. Uh, we have a transportation survey out right now, um, last week and this week. It closes this Friday. It can be found in Infinite Campus for families that are uh, transported. Um, transportation Department will use this data to create um, an emergency backup plan for when we have um, less staff, when we have staff out. Um, and we need to be able to run our routes with less drivers. So after February break, we plan to have two backup plans depending on how many drivers are out. 
hopefully everybody stays healthy, hopefully there's no issues, and that we can continue uh, working through um, our roots. Now, no plan is perfect. We're working to avoid loss of in-person instructional days. The reality is, uh, either plan we have may impact pickup times for families. And so um, if it happens at 5 a.m. in the morning, I'm not going to be able to get enough, I'm not going to be able to get information to the vast majority of parents to say that that bus is going to be a late pickup or an earlier pickup. Um, that might not be a big issue for high school kids, but for our kindergartners, for our youngest kids, our students with disabilities, it may need, I want to be fair and transparent, it might mean we need a day uh, of, of uh, remote instruction, kind of like a snow day that we're not really enjoying snow this year because it'll still be instructional, um, but it'll be an emergency remote day so we can get these uh, plans in place. It's not perfect. Um, I've been saying at every board meeting and we've been saying it uh, every year in multiple ways we need bus drivers not just us but across the county across the state and the nation although Penfield is the best district to work for if you're going to drive a bus so I really encourage you uh, to come there's there's paid training there's some bonuses we're doing everything we can to increase our uh, bus driving fleet the ones we have are are incredible and uh, and and we really appreciate all that they do uh, we have voluntary COVID testing going on. So we have tested 403 students and 138 staff members over the past two weeks. We had one positive test. So the rate of infection over these past two weeks is 0.16%. It is good data to have. We share this data regularly with the Monroe County uh, Department of Health um, and we share it with the State Department of Health. It's one of the areas we're pushing for uh, advocacy on saying we are uh, our rate of infection in schools like across all of the schools that are doing testing is extremely low it does not stay on par with the community or region infection rate we're going to continue voluntary COVID testing until february break because the county gave us four weeks of tests uh, it's about five percent a week we may continue testing after february break if the county has enough rapid tests because it's great data to have it makes a sense of feeling safe and again it's completely voluntary for students and staff if a family member wants to change that they do need to reach out to their school nurse and building a principal um, but we're going to continue to look at that testing to uh, have this data as part of our advocacy push Equity audit update, uh, I shared last meeting um, that we did partner with Progression Partners and our first training module for the seven teams, that's, uh, there's an equity uh, team at each of our six buildings as well as a district level team. And uh, we all completed our first training module via Zoom. Um, I can speak for myself that it was in extremely um, um, insightful and a great start to some really important work that we're gonna be digging into. Uh, we're going to begin seeking stakeholders for future focus groups that are going to be facilitated by progression partners so parents guardians and students at the secondary level um, and it's really important as we look at this when we talk about equity is the work is grounded in supporting all k-12 students and staff it's really trying to dig into the professional development and training to to support all students they're all coming with a different background a different cultural background uh, and and um, what can we do as teachers to be as um, as supportive as possible and so we've got some work to do we know we do uh, in this nation in this state in this county and in this district to make sure that we're truly supporting all students uh, in an equitable fashion so it's exciting work we will keep the board and the community updated as we go through our equity audit and build equity plans uh, with stakeholders for um, for starting for next year that's my updates are there any questions board members bar um, are board members going to be part of these progression partners? Um, the first cohort, no, is because of timing, but they are very willing to come in and do some presentations and training with our board. But on that topic, I will share with you that we are also, if you remember when um, Dan White and board rep Lisa Latin, board member Lisa Latin, Bosi's board member, came and presented. Uh, we just had a meeting, Jim, myself, Sheena Conway met with the, um, the, um, equity group coming out of BOCES, which will be a, a COSER. We are signing up for that. Okay. And that is a uh, obviously a local person they hired who is absolutely incredible. 
And so we did talk a bit about board and uh, board presentations, board trainings in workshops, as well as policy, and having um, her come in to work directly with uh, the policy group and the board group around these trainings. So she's going to actually step in and attend some of the progression partner work and then work with them too. So as they sort of work with us, we can also have sort of a, a value added by having the BOCES COSTAR work with us as well. That was a really long answer for a pretty short question, <laughs> but I want to get that for you. But it works for me. Thank yep. you. Yep, no problem. Yeah, thank you. I have you. a question about Go the ahead. transportation Sh survey. Um, so I was one of the parents who filled it out for both my children. Um, and currently we use the bus, but I did specify that I would drive them. How do I, how would we, or how do my neighbors or anybody else um, get communicated with? And when is the day that it implements, you know, if it's implemented, when we have to make arrangements to drive our children? Sure. So that's, so the survey right now is, is through Infinite Campus. I'll start with that. We yeah. did get some questions from parents who live in the walking zone because they didn't get the survey. Oh. And the reason they didn't get the survey is because it only went through Infinite Campus to families who utilize okay. transportation. Oh, that's and the question, question really is, um, is in an emergency situation, can you find uh, a way to get your child to school? Okay. So one of our two sort of backup plans is going to be utilizing parents to drive their children. As a public school district, I can't say, hey, we're going to be open, but only if you can get yourself here. We just talked about equity. I, it's a, yeah. it's a, a sure. critical equity piece. It's against the law. It's against state ed. I can't do that. Right. Um, so what we are going to do is build a backup plan for only picking up the kids who Need, who didn't fill out the survey, that's the reality. If you didn't fill it out, I have to assume you need the bus, not that you don't need it, and that people who said they don't need the bus, we wouldn't pick them up. So parents will be notified via either phone or email that they might have a different pickup time if they don't need the emergency, if they can't drive to school. Okay. So your question is, how will you know as a parent that I need to right. drive my child to school? That is one of the reasons why we probably will need a one day remote only day Thank so you. we can say to okay. parents tomorrow or the next three days, I'm going to need you to, to follow your emergency transportation to get your child to school. Okay, great. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's perfect. Thank you. Uh, board members, any other questions? So one of the comments we've been getting you know, recently is why are we doing this COVID testing if it's voluntary yep. and, and how much is that costing us? Oh, it's a great question. The COVID volunteer testing costs us zero dollars. They are provided by New York State. I guess we could make an argument that I'm sure our state taxes is somehow paying for it. I get that. But the district itself does not pay for the COVID test. And uh, if we don't use them, somebody else will. Right. So. Um, the reason we're doing it still is it was highly um, encouraged by the Department of Health because it is good data to have because it does, it, it again continues to show that our schools are safe because of everything that we're doing. Um, so there is no cost to us. I guess you could say there's a cost to the staff that has to do it because they, they're giving COVID tests instead of doing something else. We're utilizing our school nurses now and we have float nurses that are already on staff that come to help out. And so I'm uh, working with our school nurses. It's very easy. It ta now we've got a system in place now. Um, it doesn't take time away and they're, they're, it's good data to have. So the recommendation from our nurse coordinator is to continue the testing if the, if the county can give that to us. It's always sort of up in the air on whether they can actually um, provide us the test kits to, to keep going. Right, thank you. Mm. Okay, any other any other questions from the board? All right. um, I will now turn it over to um, Dr. Driffle for his in-depth budget development 2021-2022 and project planning and audit updates. Thank you, Dr. Putnam. Can Welcome. everybody hear me? Hmm? Yes, good. Uh, good evening. Uh, I wish Abby was still here because uh, it is that time again to talk about budget development, uh, as we will probably at every meeting for the next two and a half months or so until the board uh, finally adopts the budget, and then we you know, go out and do the legal notices, budget hearing, and, and have our vote in May. In addition to budget development discussion tonight, we also have um, some updates on our project planning and two audit updates for, for board action. So for tonight's discussion, I want to start with two um, third-party objective 
uh, fiscal standing metrics. One is the Comptroller's fiscal stress monitoring system that was released uh, last week. And then two, um, our annual credit rating, which is provided by Moody's. Then we're gonna dive into budget development. We'll look at uh, in-depth discussion on the governor's executive proposal from a few weeks back. Uh, full first draft expenditure uh, budget for the 21-22 school year, uh, the corresponding revenue budget draft uh, to match those appropriations, and then as I mentioned, the, the project planning through um, primarily our seeker resolution, which is the state's environmental impact analysis for future school projects. And then the two audits are extra classroom, which is our extracurricular clubs, uh, in the single audit, which is our federal audit for federal funds that come to the district. So first up is the fiscal stress monitoring system. This is done by the state's comptroller office. It's not just for school districts, but it's for all municipalities in New York State, counties, villages, towns, um, cities, et cetera. Uh, it's been out for, I wanna say about 10 years now. Uh, it's gotten a lot of awards from other states. Other states have tried to emulate the system. It's a tool for local governments uh, and oversight boards to determine the fiscal fitness of, of their entity. So there are financial and environmental factors and there's different classifications of stress. There's severe fiscal stress, moderate fiscal stress, susceptible to fiscal stress, and then no designation. On the financial metrics side, they look at unassigned fund balance um, as a proportion of expenditures. As a reminder, we can only have 4% of our um, budget and unassigned fund balance, but if you have an amount less than that, it can be uh, a, a metric of stress. Total fund balance relative to expenditures, the <coughs> operating surplus or deficit in a year, so did you actually take in more money than you spent? Uh, the quick ratio, so as of June 30th, the end of the year, uh, how does your current cash match your current liabilities? Um, year end cash to your average monthly expenditures, and then did you have any short term borrowing needs for that year? Uh, typically through like a tax anticipation note or a revenue anticipation note. Uh, once again, uh, Penfield had no points in the area of any of the fiscal stress markers. On the environmental metrics, so these are some things that are a little bit more out of our direct fiscal control. Uh, the percentage of economically disadvantaged students, uh, the common branch class size, so by common branch that's typically grades one through six. Uh, teacher turnover rate, the way that's measured is the amount of instructional teachers that leave the district uh, year over year for any reason. Um, change in property values, because that's a, a taxable assessed value metric. Budget vote approval as an indicator of community support of the schools and the percentage of English language learners. Uh, we had five points for Penfield only in the area of class size, uh, same as that we had in last year's report. The caveat with that is that it's based on 17-18 data, so it's more than three school years re removed, uh, which is the same data they used last year, so they didn't update it for 18-19. For As a quick point of context and comparison, I wanted to just show where we were with some of these environmental factors. Um, so the economically disadvantaged students, Penfield's at 21%. Uh, this is used through free and reduced prices uh, lunch. Back when we reviewed enrollment in the fall, we looked at the 10-year trend in free and reduced enrollment, and it's basically tripled uh, in the last 12 years or so. We were around 7%, now we're up to a little over 20%. But you can see relative to all schools in the state, Finger Lake schools and then medium upstate schools, schools of our size in upstate New York, were about half. Uh, teacher turnover rate, uh, we're at 9%, so that's lower than our comparable districts around the state. Budget vote approval, uh, 74%, so uh, about three to one or so. A little bit higher than the average across the state, which is a little bit more um, around the two to one ratio, around 70%. Change in property value year over year, we're at 2.8%, a little bit higher than uh, comparable districts and all districts around the state. English language learners, we have 2%, which is um, less than average for all schools, but about average for the Finger Lakes region and medium upstate schools. And then that common branch class size, uh, our number from the 17-18 year was 22 on average, one through six. And with a note below there, you can see that they once again had to use the old data. Uh, so take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. So the other fiscal standing report that I wanted to discuss was our Moody's credit rating. Um, the district's credit position remains very strong. 
Uh, the AA2 rating is higher than the median AA3 rating for districts of our size. The report specifically notes um, the credit factors include a healthy financial position, a strong wealth and income profile, and a sizable tax base. It also reflects a light debt burden and a moderate pension liability. Um, so having a strong credit rating is very important when we do um, borrowings for capital projects because it allows us to get a better interest rate and ultimately save, save money on our projects. So any questions on any of those two uh, fiscal metrics? Board, any questions uh, for regarding that? Okay. So diving into the budget development process. So this is, I look at project or budget development as kind of a project. So why not have a fun Gantt chart? Uh, budget calendar was reviewed and approved by the Board of Education back in the fall. Uh, we approved our factors, goals, and guidelines to help us shape the parameters of budget building. Uh, we looked at reserve planning back in our December meeting and fund balance and how we would tailor that um, to future budgets. Uh, we had budget requests out to all of our buildings and all of our different departments and uh, over the last month or so have worked to really kind of aggregate all of those requests. And then those long yellow bars are really the entirety of the spring. So we're really now in the thick of budget development. So revenue projections, as we'll discuss momentarily, um, primarily come from the state of New York and our local community through the levy. And then the appropriations analysis are kind of an ongoing development throughout the spring. Uh, when we review the budget, I'll point out some things that we know we don't know yet and some things that are definitely firmed up. So tonight is the first draft budget, so that's why that one's green. Uh, in the course of the next month or so, we'll have a second draft budget uh, that encapsulates all of the updates since then. We'll have a proposed budget for the Board of Education to adopt, I believe it's at the April 20th meeting. Um, and then there are associated legal requirements around uh, the filing in the newspaper of our budget. Uh, we have to have the budget available on the website for public inspection. We have to conduct the budget hearing. We have to send out the budget notice to the community and hold the required vote on the third Tuesday in May. So, last time we met, uh, it was the day of the governor's State of the State address. And actually, while we met, details of the budget were starting to leak out. So the governor, for many months now, has talked that New York is in a $15 billion budget gap hole and this is a two-year hole, a two-year gap. So it's $5 billion for the current fiscal year and $10 billion for next year. So the current federal aid expectations bring this down to $9 billion. So as we discussed last time, uh, the stimulus package passed in late December, the Coronavirus Relief and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act, the CRRSA, uh, provided some funds for New York that reduced the gap but the governor still believes there's a $9 billion gap uh, between the two budgets and they are seeking more. So the governor in his executive proposal, as we discussed last time, basically has two paths in this budget. One is the $9 billion gap and the second would be additional federal stimulus that closes that gap. And we'll talk about how that potentially affects uh, schools. So the entire state operating budget proposal for next year is a little over $100 billion. Um, that's just the operating general fund. The all funds budget is significantly larger than that when you look at debt service and capital funds, things like that. The education funding increase is $2.1 billion of that $104 billion budget. The state funding actually decreases $1.35 billion, but it is supplemented uh, with that $3.8 billion of uh, federal stimulus money. And we'll talk about how they do that. Uh, the good news is, is that all year long we've been talking about this threat of state aid withholdings, 20% potentially. Uh, the Division of Budget has confirmed that they are going to make all current year withholdings full. Um, so we had withholdings back in July, August, and September. Uh, the question still we don't know is when that's going to happen. But we do know that we are going to be made whole on those payments. So good news for the current fiscal year in terms of cash flow. So this is last year's school budget, 1920, in the current year, 2020-21. This is typically what we get when we get numbers from the governor. There's different aid categories. Um, they're predictable, they're reliable, they're expense-driven. Uh, we understand the formulas. The main thing going into this year was that foundation aid stayed flat. Uh, and we already know that relative to the foundation aid formula, 
Uh, New York State is nowhere close to funding foundation aid. For Penfield specifically, we're underfunded by millions of dollars a year. So that was uh, an alarming adjustment. The rest of the formulas ran kind of to our expectations. And then the strange bugaboo this year was the negative adjustment. So in this current year, that was the pandemic adjustment. And then the corresponding uh, federal stimulus that offset that was the CARES Act that was approved back mm -hmm. last March. Mm -hmm. So looking at what we received this year is a little bit different. So you can see real quickly that there's no BOCES aid, there's no instructional materials aid, there's no transportation aid. So what the governor has once again uh, decided to propose in his executive proposal is to consolidate 11 aid categories into one called services aid, uh, which is the new addition uh, in that column there, the $8 million amount. The other concerning thing with this is that foundation aid is once again flat. So that would be three years in a row where foundation aid uh, hadn't increased a single dollar. And that is the state's basic um, constitutional requirement to fund a sound and, and just uh, education. The other uh, alarming elements of this year's aid proposal was the adjustment. So it's not called the pandemic adjustment this year, it's the local funding adjustment. And then that is currently supplemented with that CRRSA money, um, $4 million. So you can see that in total, our aid is actually increasing a little bit, which is great. The other thing he added on uh, this year was STAR payments. So STAR, um, traditionally not a typical school revenue because it's actually uh, a taxpayer offset it's, it's to their property tax bill. It's not money um, that funds education, it's just a rebate for taxpayers across the state. So what he did with this, because he's essentially proposing to reduce our state aid by $4 million, that local funding adjustment, they need to show the federal government that they have a maintenance of effort towards education. So they've added in this creative accounting quirk, the line for STAR. So originally when this came out, people were scrambling, they were very nervous. Oh my goodness, they're gonna cut STAR. That's gonna be such a major problem. It seems like the convergent thinking is now that this is just a tactic to show the federal government that yes, we, we are eligible for the federal stimulus money. We do give schools this money, it, um, they're calling it total district support, which is I put there on the bottom. So it might shape up to be an argument over accounting technicalities, um, but for now, I just wanted you to be aware of it. So we did actually dig through the reporting and were able to extrapolate what that services aid would be under a traditional aid run. Um, the concerning things, as I mentioned, was that foundation aid is flat again, so it'd be the third straight year. BOCES aid does project to bounce up a little bit, um, primarily due to all the tech purchases that we had this year. So the aid that we get back, the reimbursement, uh, is good news for next year. The instructional material aids is, as a reminder, our textbook money, hardware money, library money, and software money uh, that the state gives on a per pupil basis. Because enrollment ticked down a little bit this year, that's why that's projected to decrease a little bit. Uh, excess cost aid is cost associated with our special ed kiddos, um, pretty much flat year over year. Transportation aid is projected to, to bounce up. I, the reason I wanted to point this out, um, as I'll discuss on my next slide, is that one of the conversations we've had at this, uh, with this group is that the state has proposed not reimbursing transportation costs for last spring. So from March to June, um, there's been a proposal that because bus drivers were not actually bringing kids to school, that that aid would not be eligible. And it sounds like that is actually gonna happen. So while this accounts for the full amount in my budget projection, I'm backing out what I anticipate we'll lose. Um, so it looks good on paper, but it's not gonna come to fruition uh, unless there's legislative action. Building aid uh, ticks up in accordance with our expectations. And then, as I mentioned, that local funding adjustment takes the state money away and the federal stimulus supplants it. So one of the things we're not allowed to do with our federal funding is uh, supplant, not supplement, or vice versa. So you can see the irony. So some of my concerns with the executive budget that I think will be addressed in advocacy with the Monroe County School Board, School uh, Boards Association of New York, NISCUS, um, and all the typical educational groups is that services category consolidation. 
for next year, the formulas gonna, are going to run as is. So there's no immediate effect for the 21-22 school year. But after next year, that would be capped and then limited to a growth factor. So services A would increase with CPI. Services A would increase by 2%. Um, part of the major concern with that is because BOCES aid is lumped into that and our BOCES just underwent a major capital project, we get aid back on the debt service costs associated with that. So the building aid is typically way more than 2% or 1%. So it's possible that that would be capped at 2%, so which would really hurt us. Um, this really actually hurts um, smaller school districts across the state that really rely on BOCES for levered services, districts that maybe can't afford to have different vocational training or other kind of things like that. So limiting uh, BOCES aid would be a major red flag. So I know this has already been addressed by some of the advocacy groups, but just making sure we discuss it. STAR is a new form of aid listing, obviously a concern. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. I don't think it actually will be listed as an aid. I think it's an accounting workaround, but we'll keep eyes on it. The local funding adjustment correlates to the very bottom bullet in that this is lining up to be the exact same situation that we had 12 years ago with the Great Recession, the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And that led to the gap elimination adjustment with schools. So from 2009 to 2016, there were seven years of aid reductions. Mm -hmm. So basically aid um, finally was restituted in 2016 to levels that it was in 2018. The concern that next year, okay, they're plugging this hole with federal stimulus money, that's okay for next year, that, that's good news for now, but the concern is what's the knock-on effect for the next five, six, yeah. you know, however long it takes to uh, recover. As I mentioned, that spring 2020 transportation reimbursement does not look like um, it's going to be paid, at least according to the governor, but we'll see what happens with the assembly and Senate. Uh, they have once again built in withholding rights uh, for next year, depending on how the economy performs. It's not 20% next year, it's 5%. So it's a little bit better, but just the fact that they've built that in is a bit of a concern. Uh, charter school tuition is uh, aid uh, halved in this proposal, so we know Around the state, a lot of kiddos choose to uh, attend charter schools and school districts pay tuition to those charter schools and then get some aid back on it. Uh, that would be reduced by 50, 50%. This one hasn't got a lot of press, but I think it's um, really concerning. So there is a proposal to change the Enhanced STAR program. So the difference between regular STAR and Enhanced STAR is Enhanced STAR, it's um, colloquially called Senior STAR sometimes because of the age. Our requirement, you need to be at least 65 years old and also on a certain income level. The way it works now is if you are on the regular STAR program, uh, you can immediately age up to the enhanced STAR when you turn 65 and maintain the rebate on your tax bill. This would force um, people that are on regular STAR, the old exemption rebate program, whereas it's actually a deduction on your tax bill, to convert to the credit program. So anybody that's moved since 2016 uh, knows that you pay the full tax bill and then a month later or so you get the tax credit after the fact. Mm -hmm. So what this would do for people moving up to 65 is it would increase their school tax bill and then they would get a check after the fact, you know, a month or two later whenever the tax and finance department sends the check. So for those that are on fixed incomes, those that have um, you know, specific cash flow requirements, it's a, it's a major red flag. Uh, you would think politically this would encounter some opposition, um, but I just wanted you to be aware. The other change that he has once again proposed is eliminating prior year aid eligibility. So schools can currently look back and see if they didn't properly claim aid the way they should and amend it, make the change and be made whole on that. Now, if you don't do it timely within that fiscal year, you would be ineligible for prior year aid. Uh, this happens a lot with capital projects where one piece of paperwork got mixed up, um, staff turned over, and you're talking about millions of dollars in aid potentially that um, are lost into the ether. So, we'll continue to keep eyes on Albany. <laughs> but are there any questions uh, as it relates currently to the governor's overall budget uh, proposal package or how it relates to Penfield Central? Uh, board members, any questions on the material covered so far? I have a couple here. Was the, the consolidation of aid that you mentioned mm -hmm. is, is 
I, maybe you said I didn't hear it. Is that a done deal or is that his proposal? Just a proposal. Okay. So Good. he's so proposed that for the last couple of years and it's been shot down by the legislature. And, and can you explain, the, again, the risks of having it all rolled into one versus having it broken out by as it's used? Yeah, absolutely. So if I just quickly jump back to this slide. So for instance, services aid next year would be capped at the $8 million uh, mark. You can see next year we're projected to increase almost $500,000 in BOCES aid. Uh, we're projected almost $500,000 in transportation aid. Uh, if you took a 2% uh, amount of $8 million, you know, you can see that it's drastically under what we would get if the formulas ran as is. Thank you. And then, um, oh, and you had talked about, you know, going forward where there's, they're doing this adjustment, which is based on the federal stimulus. Mm -hmm. uh, this, to me again, sounds like the state's essentially doing deficit spending, where they're, uh, what's happening is they're relying on someone else's money to cover the costs, and when that someone else's money goes away, there's a big gap, and then and so they're kicking the can essentially, which is what they always warn districts not to do, and so that looks like that's if that goes that way, that's a future risk in upcoming years is suddenly having that, you know, if we get the adjustment but we don't get the stimulus, mm -hmm. or they have to find some way to accommodate it. Yeah, and I think there's by putting it out there publicly that he's threatening these local funding um, adjustments. I think it's an implicit threat to Washington to say, look, we really need it, otherwise it's gonna hurt you know, the trickle down effect. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of motives at play with that. Yeah. But yeah, real consider serious threats for future budget planning. Hey, thank you. So I think that, any, was there anything else? Nope, okay. Okay, mm -hmm. so now we're gonna jump into the expenditure draft uh, for next year's school budget. So this is a very high level. Um, this is the function. Uh, this is the way we report um, our expenses to the state. It's how we have to budget it uh, by the comptroller's accounting reporting manual. So there's a couple uh, items I wanna point out and we'll dive into all these a little bit deeper, but general support is typically administrative costs. So that's currently projected to tick up a little over 2% all of our instructional costs, that's everything related to what happens in our schools, also projected to tick up 2%. Transportation costs uh, projected to increase 2.93%. And undistributed costs are our community services. It is all of the employee benefits, it's debt service and interfund transfers. Um, right now projected to increase about 1%. The bottom line for where we are uh, February 2nd is that our budget is only expected to increase 1.8% uh, next year. So that's under our, our typical two-ish percent, a little over 2%. So for where we stand now, uh, I think that's, that's pretty good news and we'll unpack this quite a bit. So first up is the general support budget. So board operations consists of everything related to the Board of Education, uh, tax collection, the annual meeting, uh, board memberships, all the legal requirements of the Board of Education. I should remind um, all viewers and attendees that board members are not paid, uh, they're volunteers, so there's no money to actual members uh, within this. Uh, the big jump this year was the partnership with Penfield TV uh, and making sure we have the streaming options uh, in the remote environment. District office costs is everybody related uh, to anybody that works at district office. So it's our clerical staff, it's our superintendent, it's our assistant superintendents, uh, folks in registration, so on and so forth. All of the contractual costs for printing and BOCES costs, uh, that comes out of here. So that's currently projected to increase 1.87%. Operations and maintenance is everything related to our facilities department, central services as we call it, um, currently scheduled to increase 1%. Um, Mr. McNeff will be at our meeting on the 23rd and we'll unpack this a little bit in further detail. Professional services are all of those required legal services that we uh, have to carry as a school district in New York. So there's attorneys, there's auditors, all the insurance um, costs that go uh, with things we have to do. Currently projected to tick up a little over 5% in terms of labor costs. 
Public information is everything related to the newsletters, postage, mail um, that we put out, or our website, all the communications. The reason this is showing as an increase this year is I moved the postage to this area. Um, I think that's a more appropriate area than where it previously was, um, just in district office. OC's administration. Uh, this is the first area where I must say that I don't know what this actual cost is going to be yet. Um, so we just are starting to see BOCES costs roll out. Uh, we've seen BOCES costs for Monroe 1, Monroe 2 BOCES, and Erie 1, but we have not seen costs for Genesee Valley BOCES uh, and Wayne Finger Lakes BOCES for our cross contracts. So all of the BOCES costs herein are um, subject to change. We'll be reviewing those uh, in the next couple of weeks for further clarity and we'll go over any uh, changes associated. So uh, just about 10% of our overall budget, 2.16% uh, increase for the general support uh, portion of our costs. Diving into uh, the meat of our budget, so over half of the budget here is strictly uh, associated with our schools. Um, starting at the top is curriculum development, so this is everything associated with curriculum writing, summer planning, professional development, uh, so on and so forth. School supervision is everything related to our um, principal's offices, all the clerical folks, administrative assistants that work in there. The reason this is decreasing 16% um, is because there was three FTEs in this area that I have moved to what I think are more appropriate places. So the athletic director is moving to the interscholastic and athletics. Um, we have a special ed director that's moving to the special ed, uh, special programs. Uh, and then our director of technology was also housed here and that's just moving to the technology realm. Um, so that's down quite a bit this year, uh, over 16%. Schools are all the activity associated with regular school teaching. So our actual classrooms um, currently projected to increase 4.7%. Special programs are all of the costs associated with students with IEPs. Um, this is another area that is subject to change because we have so many costs in BOCES and some of our placements so with annual reviews coming up. Um, some of this will crystallize a little bit further, but from where we stand now, um, seems like we're gonna have a little bit of a decrease anyway. Occupational education are all the costs associated with our vocational educational uh, training opportunities. Uh, both in-house here and at BOCES placements. Um, another one of those areas, because it's so BOCES reliant, that's subject to change a little bit, depending on what happens uh, with high school scheduling for next year, as people start building their schedules. So we'll keep an eye on that in the weeks ahead. Uh, library, so uh, this is everything associated with all the library in our schools. It's ticking down just a little bit because I moved some of the software costs that were currently in there to the technology realm. So technology, <laughs> increasing uh, over 50%. I want to point out that I believe this is going to come down. Um, so right now in that $3.9 million, uh, there's $2 million alone uh, attributed to BOCES costs based on co some current year spending that we have. Uh, so we'll be able to flesh this one out a little bit further. I'll go much deeper uh, detail on technology. But I think that is going to ultimately decrease because I don't think we're going to have the massive outlay like we had this year, as Dr. Putnam mentioned earlier, just rapidly deploying a one-to-one -one, uh, technology environment. Pupil services is everything related to our guidance office, social workers, um, nurses, psychologists. Um, shows as ticking down 6%. I, I just learned today that this will um, claw back a little bit. Uh, the primary reason why we think this area is going to decline is our health contracts, um, trying to determine what's going to happen with private school enrollment next year. Um, so again, kind of enrollment dependent, we'll continue to keep an eye on that as we move forward. Um, and then extracurriculars, all of our clubs, all of the after school activities we offer here at Penfield, and then all of the athletic programs that we have, uh, maintaining all of our services, uh, with everything in this budget, I should have added, uh, at 1.25%. So the overall instructional realm um, scheduled to increase a little over 2% uh, for where we stand tonight. So transportation, um, our director of transportation is here tonight. Um, we're gonna dive a little further into detail because uh, Gino is able to join us. 
I should note that Gina's uh, retirement was accepted by the board in the consent agenda tonight. Um, so just congratulations to Gina, and I'm really gonna miss her, we're really gonna miss her, uh, but also happy for her next steps too. So she'll be able to answer any questions uh, related to um, not just the budget side of transportation, but if you have operational questions around uh, anything with transportation, she can field those questions. So pupil transportation overall, this is how we get all of our kids to school. So this is the transportation staff, it's the mechanics, it's uh, everything associated with our buses, fuel, so on, uh, scheduled to increase a little over 3%, and then everything associated with operations of the bus garage itself, um, down 17%, but $5,000 of that is just a reduction in electricity costs. So that's basically where that comes from. So overall transportation scheduled to increase about 3%. Uh, so we'll just dive a little further into transportation detail, um, office staff, $350,000, about you know, flat for next year, a little under 1%. Bus drivers, um, as we are looking to actively recruit and hire bus drivers, hoping that uh, we can make the payroll to uh, attract more drivers, uh, so that's why that's up 4%. Our mechanics, currently scheduled to increase 1.6%. Equipment, uh, looks like it's gonna double this year. I know this is due specifically to a tire changer, I wanna say, but we could ask Gina specifically on that, if I recall our conversations. Uh, I should point your attention to the contractual line. This is almost entirely due to our charter transportation for out of district runs that we don't typically do ourselves um, based on distance or if it's McKinney-Vento, a homeless situation where it's a really long run. Uh, we had, Typically long-standing relationships with companies that didn't even bid this year on um, some of the runs because they themselves had driver shortages or they had insurance requirements that they couldn't meet. So the bidding environment for these out-of-district runs was very um, advantageous for the vendors. So we saw major price increases, so that's why we're forecasting a big jump there. Uh, hopefully some things change in that environment, but that's where we currently stand. Uh, gasoline fuel scheduled to decrease a little bit just based on um, some of the consistently low prices we've seen with gas over the past couple of years. Materials and supplies, this relates to um, cleaning supplies, custodial supplies, but also bus parts, tires, oil, all of the things that go with uh, keeping our, our buses running smooth. Like I said, the garage itself scheduled to decrease. And then I added BOCES transportation into this um, another area that has major red flags. So currently BOCES does transportation for us for extended school year during the summer. They do field trips for us. There's lots of different um, special education um, partnerships that we do. They weren't able to do a lot this year. So our contract was much smaller than we anticipated. So that $960,000 where we were last year uh, is less this year. So trying to forecast for next year, uh, is definitely a bit cumbersome at this point. Um, continuing to work with them, they, like everyone else, are having driver shortages and having to kind of cut back some of their services. So before I jump into the next section of undistributed costs, did anybody have any questions for Gina? Or Board, anyone have any questions for the content? Mm -mm. All right, so. keep going. Thanks, Gina. Congratulations, Gina. You're not leaving yet, though. <laughs> <laughs> Ways to go. So undistributed costs. So this is uh, kind of the catch-all where everything else remains. Uh, community services, that's just our registrar. So everything associated with enrollment, uh, that's just based on a new person stepping into that role, um, employee turnover. The ERS system, as we mentioned last time, is seeing a big rate increase uh, in the employer contribution rate. Uh, that coupled with big earnings increases in the minimum wage at the state um, is why we're seeing such a big increase in that system. TRS, uh, as I'll mention in a moment, is one of those things that we're still waiting on final clarity. We know the employer contribution rate is gonna be between 9.5% and 10%. Uh, we just don't know exactly what it is yet. But based on uh, last year's rate, it's very similar. So we don't anticipate much of a change in cost there. Payroll taxes are our employer contribution to Social Security and Medicare tax. Um, so FICA uh, on the paycheck is what people see. Um, based on pretty similar year-to-year -year wage earnings, uh, that basically stays the same. 
Workers' compensation, as we discussed back uh, in December when we had reserve planning, that consortium is performing very well. Uh, there was a lot of reduced uh, workers' compensation claims last year. Um, go figure, when a lot of people were <laughs> not here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just one of those weird quirks of, of the COVID environment. Um, so that's scheduled to decrease next year. Unemployment uh, insurance and disability insurance costs are currently projected to stay the same. Uh, health and dental. So this is another one of those um, kind of outlier years where the consortium for medical insurance performed very well um, because so many hospitals were not doing elective procedures and people weren't traveling as much and people weren't outside doing dangerous things. Uh, we just had much less reduced claims. So typically we've been seeing over the years health trends at 8%, 10%, 12%. Uh, next year, we're going to see much smaller rates because the consortiums perform so well. The consortium has fund balance. We can keep rates down this year. Uh, dental had a zero increase, so completely flat year over year there. Debt service uh, is bond obligations that we owe for old capital projects. Those are usually over a 15-year cycle, so principal and interest. Um, scheduled to increase uh, $200,000 in accordance with our debt service schedule. And then interfund transfers, uh, a big drop off here. The reason being that we're not planning to use budget appropriations uh, to buy buses next year. We have over $5 million in capital reserves uh, to buy buses. So that's a little bit of budget relief that we, we didn't need to uh, utilize this year. So all in all, um, looking at the undistributed budget, where typically we have some of our highest cost drivers, that whole portion of the budget is only up 1%. Uh, about $33 million or a third of our overall budget. So then another way of looking at the budget, those were the functional areas of the accounting domain that the state likes to see, is the object. So uh, wages, as I mentioned before with the payroll taxes, basically scheduled to stay flat. Um, equipment costs in the district scheduled to decrease uh, a little bit. This is based on so many of the ongoing projects that we've had, and because we've been in this COVID environment, the equipment hasn't been needed to be replaced as often, so that's coming down a little bit. Contractual costs writ large, up 2%. Contractual costs encapsulate everything from professional development to our building utilities to um, you know, printer contracts, leases, so on and so forth. BOCES costs currently scheduled to increase over 10%. Uh, primarily driven by special education and technology. Like I said, I think that's gonna come down a little bit once we sharpen that pencil. Uh, but we'll be sure to bring updated numbers to the board once the BOCES numbers are finalized and we get all of the requests from the BOCES that we haven't heard from yet. Materials and supplies across the district scheduled to decrease a little bit. Uh, some of the budget requests that came in, um, materials just haven't manifested like they traditionally have. Debt service, as I mentioned before, scheduled to tick up a little bit. Uh, employee benefits overall, uh, under 3%. And then those interfund transfers down quite a bit um, due to the reduction in, in buses. Uh, I should note that the interfund transfers are currently for special education during the summer. And then any outstanding obligations um, that students may have to the lunch fund at the end of the year. And then just another way of looking at that um, object budget, you can kind of quickly see that three quarters of our costs are uh, personnel related. Education is definitely a people business. Uh, I think we've learned this year more than ever um, that we hold that belief to be true. Debt service holds 6% of our budget, materials and supplies 1%, BOCES 12%, contractual costs 7%, and all the equipment uh, 1%. Interfund transfers make up less than 1%. So jumping to the other side of the ledger, uh, the current revenue projection. So as we discussed at our last meeting, the levy itself is projected to increase 1.97% next year with the tax cap. Uh, the extra 2% is just for fines associated with late fees and so on. New York State Aid, um, currently showing a small projection when you pull out that transportation aid that we expect to lose. This can and probably will change in the legislative budget that's due April 1st, so we'll keep a close eye on that. County sales tax, I have actually scheduled to increase a little bit. Uh, I don't wanna explain that a little. So we get county sales tax from Monroe County and Wayne County. 
Monroe County allocates uh, county sales tax to schools proportionally based on how much they actually receive in receipts, whereas Wayne County allocates a, a flat amount every year. It's $5.4 million divided by the enrollment of kiddos that live in Wayne County. Um, the reason I'm increasing it is because I don't think county sales tax is going to increase 8%. It's because last year we decreased our expectations based on the economic environment. Um, sales tax, or I think, declined more than 10% in Monroe County from April, May to June. But then over the next two quarters, it actually increased. Uh, it finished the year down 2.8%, which is pretty close to national GDP. Um, but next year, it's forecasted to tick up a little bit, uh, back to normal levels. So that's why that shows a year-over-year -year increase. All other revenue, uh, again, that's kind of a volatile area. The major reason why this is scheduled to decrease 10% right now is bank earnings, the interest on our bank accounts. Uh, as you probably know, interest rates are very low right now. Uh, so we're seeing a big reduction there. And then there's also a lot of questions about uh, like game admissions, driver's ed, um, some of those kind of ancillary revenue things that we'll continue to keep an eye on. Uh, assigned fund balance, we've traditionally allocated a little over $2 million historically here at Penfield. Um, we may do that again, but for now that's not determined, so I have that as a question mark. And then in accordance with our debt service schedule and um, using money from the debt service reserve, we have a $390,000 inner fund transfer. So, when you add all that up, here's where we stand as of February 2nd. So we have scheduled appropriations at $104.4 million. We have anticipated revenue at $102.4 million. So that leaves us with a current shortfall of a little over $2 million. Uh, and as I mentioned just before on the last slide, um, that's typically what we allocate in our appropriated fund balance. So at this point, knock on wood, it doesn't look like we're really going to have to stretch too far to make the ends meet. It looks like the budget is coming together um, pretty soundly. It looks like we're in okay shape, uh, depending on what happens with, with the state budget and some of the expenses that need to bear out in the next, you know, six weeks ahead. But as of right now, we stand okay. So the board knows you have some options to reduce uh, that shortfall. We can reduce expenditures. Uh, we can appropriate fund balance like we historically have. We can utilize reserves. Uh, we have reserves for that purpose. We can increase revenue by advocating for additional state aid, or we always have the option of breaking uh, the tax cap. Uh, Penfield has a longstanding commitment of adhering to the tax cap, so I think that's always the last case scenario and nothing anybody wants to do, but it is always an option um, for fiscal policy. So regarding the budget, uh, we do have some questions. Obviously, all eyes are on Albany as deliberations continue for the state budget due April 1st. And then, <laughs> if so, there's eyes on DC because they're turning their glaze to DC to see if they're gonna get the money to make uh, their budget whole. So uh, the president has put forward a $1.9 trillion stimulus package. Um, there's been a counter proposal around $600 billion. So it seems like deliberations are ongoing. There is money earmarked for K through 12 in both of those proposals. Um, so positive developments, but obviously a ways to go. As I mentioned, we still don't have final rates for TRS. Uh, we still don't have final costs for BOCES determined. We don't have our insurance costs yet, our actual insurance, like our commercial insurance, umbrella balloon policies. Um, and then we still have to have many further conversations about monitoring enrollment. Um, what does the appropriate staffing look like? We have some outstanding collective bargaining. Uh, and then the annual review process um, always makes some late determinations to the budget as well. So looking ahead on budget, um, so next time around, like I mentioned before, we'll have Mr. McNiff come and we'll look a little further at B&G and provide any pertinent budget updates. Uh, March 1st, that levy calculation is submitted to the state, uh, state comptroller's office, tax and finance department. Uh, March 9th, we plan to have a full second draft budget available for review and identify any ballot propositions. So right now we know the ballot propositions that we're tentatively thinking are the land purchase, um, for the Barry property, that would be the future um, site of our buildings and grounds and transportation facility. And then we also need to create a new capital reserve. March 23rd, any budget updates uh, as that closes in on that April 1st legislative budget due date. 
April 3rd, uh, budget legal notices begin to be disseminated in our papers of record. And then on April 20th, uh, the Board of Education adopts the superintendent's 2021-22 academic year budget. So I know that was a lot of information. <laughs> so I'm happy uh, to answer any immediate questions you have, or you could always obviously reach out to Tom afterwards and I could get you an answer if something comes up after the fact. Thank you, Dr. Driffel. So this is discussion time. Is there anything? No. Anyone have any questions or discussion? Mm -mm. No. <laughs> I'm Thank you. I was just going to say it's great to see. We know we hired the right successor for Dr. Sansusi because he is equally as riveting in his budget presentations as Dr. Sansusi was. I assure you I take that as a compliment. <laughs> it's meant to be. No, no. So good news right now. It, it's positive. The budget story is shaping up to be a, a good year. I don't foresee any um, staffing cuts. I don't foresee any program reductions. I, I think things are in pretty good shape right now. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the next item I had for discussion tonight was the seeker resolution, as we mentioned last time. So this continues the process that we started in the spring of 2020. Um, Penfield continues to serve as lead agency uh, in this endeavor. It looks at the full intent of the future project scope. So we've been very transparent in our efforts uh, to purchase this property that we are planning to build an operation center there to house our bus garage uh, and buildings and grounds department. But it also further discusses some of the ancillary project work that we're also planning um, in, in that project. So at all of our school buildings, we're planning some maintenance work, um, planning some site work. So when we are identifying uh, the full scope of the environmental impact statement, it's very transparent to the community that in the fall, when we're planning the project and going out to the community with a referendum, we can point back in the spring and say, this is really what we were planning. The environmental impact statement um, was a negative declaration through the work of our architects and um, environmental council. Um, so theo thorough reviews were conducted of traffic analysis, geotechnical, wetland delineations, um, and other environmental assessment. All of those report exhibits are available on our webpage under the 21-22 um, budget webpage for community review. So any questions on the environmental um, statement up for review tonight? And board members, any discussion on the on that? No. Okay. All right, we're getting there. All right, so last things. Uh, the audit committee recently met uh, a couple weeks back to discuss um, the two new audits that were furnished by our auditors, Mengel Metzger Bar, uh, the first of which being the extra classroom audit uh, completed for the fiscal year 1920 last year. Um, there was a handful of findings, kind of like there typically are uh, when we deal with our student clubs. Uh, so like some meeting minutes weren't taken. Um, there was instances where um, uh, checks were written by the club that didn't have approval of the club because kids weren't at the meeting itself, they were at ski club. <laughs> so some of those kind of unique issues. Uh, we did review corrective action. Uh, with the audit committee. Uh, they didn't have any um, anticipate or further suggestions. So we're bringing that back to the board tonight, the corrective action, and then all prior year findings uh, were corrected to the auditor's satisfaction. So that's always a, a positive note. And then finally, the single audit, it's called the single audit, but it's actually the federal audit. So any money that we get from the federal government has to be audited. So these are the title funds that we receive. Um, these are the 611, 619 funds that we receive for special education services, funds we receive for English language learners, um, community schools, everything that routes through the uh, cafeteria fund because we're part of the school lunch program. So overall, we received $2.2 million in federal funding. Um, Penfield was deemed a low risk oddity by the amount of our funding and the protocols and procedures that we have in place. And um, like prior years on the single audit, there were no findings or recommendations. Um, so no corrective action proposed. So I don't know if any of our audit committee members had anything mm -hmm. further to add on that or, okay. Board members, any uh, questions or comments? I'll 
turn it over to mm -hmm. Mr. Pfeiffer. Thank you, sir. Would you uh, be, continue to be my clicker for me? Oh, yeah, I've only you. got two slides, so it should be pretty good. Um, as the board will recall, earlier in the year, we did present for your approval a professional learning plan for the school year. Um, uh, part of that plan includes uh, CTLE providers, continuing teaching learning education providers. In order for teachers to earn the required hours, uh, 100 hours over every five years for our uh, professionally certified uh, staff, um, they need to receive professional learning experiences from approved providers. Providers can be approved uh, in one of two ways. Basically, they can apply directly to the New York State Education Department um, and explain in their application how they will meet the requirements set forth by the Education Department and supply an $800 check um, to become an approved provider on that list. Or they can be approved by uh, individual school districts and BOCES uh, who will basically say on, on their behalf that they are meeting those requirements uh, set forth by the State Education Department. Um, and so uh, we've been working with some of these partners uh, just started, so uh, uh, Mr. Kareem Hayes, Pathstone uh, Corporation, Progression Partners, and Dr. Tamika Wagstaff have all been uh, working with us to help us on our equity journey. Um, and so we want to make sure that our teachers can get the CTLE hours for their work in that regard. And then also the Rochester Philharmonic is going to be doing some work with our music department here in the spring. And we wanted to make sure that we can uh, give those, those music teachers the credit uh, for that work as well. And so in order for that to happen, we have to bring these uh, back to the board because we want to add them to our existing professional learning plan. And if we're going to change that plan, we need your approval to do it. Um, so uh, later on in the agenda, we'll be, you'll see the, the full plan with these additions to it. Uh, and we're asking you to consider approving that so that our teachers can, can earn uh, their CTLE credits through these plans as well. There was a question um, just about whether or not um, teachers and administrators can uh, engage in other professional learning that doesn't provide CTLE. And yes, they can. If that professional learning still aligns with our strategic plan as a district and our professional learning plan, they can certainly take it. But we might not see that um, it meets all of the requirements to provide them with the CTLE credit. It might still be a valuable learning experience, but if it doesn't meet those um, pieces, then they can't earn the credit for it. So, yeah, but it is possible. Are there any questions about the, the additions to the professional learning plan? That board members? Oh. Thank you. I'll just note as a follow-up to Jim's presentation that I just look at that list of what we're asking the board to approve so we can get that CTLE um, credit and and we talked earlier about equity and a number of these um, uh, uh, contacts and uh, providers are really around the equity work. The past mm -hmm. stones yeah. um, work for our fourth grade teachers to, to start that. We've talked a lot about that this summer. Progression partners we've talked about. Uh, Dr. Wagstaff, and as well as, as Mr. Hayes, um, some, some incredible work that's taken place in our district. So um, that's my two cents on, on please approve. <laughs> um, and then before I turn it over and say my favorite line of, of the evening, I just wanted to, to acknowledge uh, that was uh, Dr. Driffle's first uh, go at a Penfield um, budget. And uh, I, I give him a lot of credit because um, because uh, building a budget for this district is is uh, is a large scale job, and he's uh, has shoes of Dr. Sansusi to fill. Um, uh, Dr. Driffle uh, tells me a lot in regards to uh, just being named in the in the same room as as, as Dr. Sansusi is uh, is a positive thing. So I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Dan. And, uh, and acknowledge the work that Dr. Sansusi has done in this district to, to put us in a spot where, where our assistant superintendent can say, we're in, we're in a pretty good spot as we, as we look towards next year. So um, I don't know what the line is on, on the shoulders of giants. And so- I think um, you're trying to say, not filling the shoes, but riding the coattails. Not filling the shoes, <laughs> riding the coattails. I, I look forward to, uh, one of the things I just, I'm, I'm gonna go off for just one second to just let you know one of the things that that, uh, that uh, inspired me about Dr. Driffle when, when he was finally hired after a long and rigorous interview process is the, the thought process of being able to build into a district and, and be looked at down the road of retiring after 25 years like Dr. Sansusi did. So it's so a thank you to Dr. Sansusi for all the work and a welcome to Dan um, for, for building this budget and, and keeping me and the board and the community very informed, um, transparent wise in regards to everything that goes into it. It's not as, it's not, a, it's not that simple. So thank you very, very much. Yes, absolutely. Thank and you. now I get to say my favorite line of that concludes superintendent reports. Okay. So we are, on section seven, a, which is facilities seeker resolution. <clears throat> so the Dr. Driffle, 
just uh, mentioned and explained the seeker resolution. So here we will re read it and if appropriate, have a motion and a second to approve it. And this is the state environmental quality review resolution of the Penfield Central School District for the Transportation Operations Center project. Whereas the Penfield Central School District proposes to undertake tra transportation operation center project previously known as the 2021 capital improvement project, which includes building and site improvements at seven sites for eight locations, including construction of a proposed building and grounds and transportation building at a site to be acquired on the corner of Jackson Road and Plank Road and upgrades, replacements, rehabilitation, and or reconstruction of various district facilities, including additions and site improvements at the district office, the Penfield High School, the Bay Trail Middle School, Cobbles Elementary School, Harris Hill Elementary School, Scribner Elementary School, and Indian Landing Elementary School. And whereas the New York State Education Department regulations for school district implementation of State Environmental Quality Review Act specify that the local district and Board of Education and not the SED is the appropriate agency to undertake the project review under the CEQA Act. And whereas the Board of Education of Penfield Central School District becomes the CEQA lead agency, I'm sorry, became the CEQA lead agency for the project on May 26, 2020, and no other involved agency had objected to the board acting as a CEQA lead agency. And whereas the district commissioned Apple Osborne to prepare a full environmental assessment form for the project, including among other things, a traffic study. And whereas the board has considered the project, reviewed public comments and reviewed the project EAF dated March 19th, 2020, including all parts and attachments and the criteria set forth in CEQA to determine whether the project may have a significant adverse effect on the environment. Now, therefore, the board resolves and confirms that the project is a type one action pursuant to 6 New York NYCRR 617.4 and further resolves that the project will not have a significant adverse impact on the environment for the reasons more particularly set forth in the attached negative declaration and that no draft environmental impact statement is required in accordance with CEQA hereby adopts the negative declaration with regards to the project and further resolves that the assistant superintendent for business and finance of the district file a negative declaration with the supervisor of the town of Penfield, the SED and all involved agencies and any person who may have requested a copy maintain the EAF and negative declaration in a file easily accessible to the public and make the documents available upon request. And finally resolves that the requirements of the CEQA and 6 NYCRR part 617 have been met. So may I have a motion and a second to adopt this CEQA resolution? So uh, and, second, so move. <laughs> okay, any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Yes, Motion no. carries. <laughs> okay. Let's see, single audit report. <clears throat> Again, Dr. Trifol had covered that just a few moments ago, so it would be appropriate that the um, board pass this resolution. Copies of the single audit report for the year ending June 30th, 2020 have been provided to the Board of Education members by Mengel Metzer Bar and Company, LLP, Raymond F. Wagner, CPA, PC, Division for Review. Those persons responsible for areas covered by the audit have also received the report. The report is positive and unqualified. As in prior years, there were no material instances of noncompliance or questioned costs. The report has been reviewed and accepted by the audit committee at their January 21st, 2021 meeting. Assistant Superintendent for Business and, and, and Finance, <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Daniel Driffle is present to answer any questions the board may have. If the board approves, the following motion is in order. So may I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education accept the single audit report for the year ending 
March 30, I'm sorry, June 30th, 2020. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? The motion carries. Extra classroom activity fund financial report. The annual independent audit report of the extra classroom activity funds prepared for the Board of Education by Mengel Metzer Bar and Company, LLP, Raymond w F. Wagner, CPA, PC Division, has been reviewed and accepted by the district's audit committee at their January 21st, 2021 meeting and has subsequently been provided to the board for review. The audit contains statements for the year ending June 30th, 2020, a corrective action plan for all concerns noted in the audit accompanies the report. Assistant Superintendent for Business and Finance, Dr. Dan Driffel, is present to answer any questions the board may have. If the board approves, the following motion is order. So may I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education accepts the extra classroom activities financial report for the year ending June 30th, 2020. So moved. Wait. Did I hear a second? Second. Okay. Any okay. questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? And the motion carries. Professional learning plan approval. So it is appropriate recommended that the board approve the updated professional learning plan for the 2020-2021 school year. So may have a motion and a second that the board approve the updated professional learning plan as presented for the 2020-2021 school year. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> policies for second read. We have um, a number of policies for second read. Uh, they include six four, uh, 6480, the use of social media and the company of regulation. 6540, defense and indemnification of the board members and employees. 6551, family medical leave. 6560, employee assistance program. So, as it may have a motion and a second that these policies be approved as presented. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> so we have the uh, Monroe County School Board Association meetings. <coughs> Is there we any um, information to share regarding the information exchange committee? Um, yes, I'll try to make this brief. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was actually very interesting, so I don't want to be too brief just because it was um, the presenter was Jamie, Jamie Scripps, and she was the teacher um, uh, on special assignment at Rush Henry at a central school district. And she talked about um, English language learners, um, especially during the pandemic, which was really quite interesting. So I'll try to, I try to sum it up as much as possible here, but um, she described, um, they call them L's. So she described L's as persons whose dominate, dominant language is not English and emphasized each L has a unique background. Um, and they may be individuals from a wide variety of circumstances, such as American-born non-English speakers, um, which was my father actually, immigrants arriving in the U.S. by choice, uh, refugees arriving in the U.S. not by choice, so as a result of a natural disaster, war, et cetera, and unaccompanied, uh, unaccompanied minors living with families that in some cases they don't speak the child's native language and children of visiting scholars. Um, and so uh, she talked a lot about how the pandemic impacted the L's. Um, she's noted that prior to the pandemic, L's uh, that exited a language acquisition program um, were successful in school. So that was prior to the pandemic. Um, currently, L's are functioning below their mainstream peers due to circumstances related to the pandemic. Um, but given time and services that they can be expected to perform as their peers again. Um, the pandemic was, has negatively affected families of L's and created barriers to their education. Um, which we can assume. Uh, examples given included COVID infection rates and mortality can be twice as high for immigrants. Students may lack internet access and quiet study areas. Families may lack experience with, with, experience with computers or have fewer resources to help their children. And parents can be essential workers outside the home. Um, so parents tend to not be in, in, in the home. 
um, prior trauma can be triggered. Um, so some students may face increased um, isolation and discrimination. They may not feel safe at school or based on previous experiences, may not expect learning to continue if school's buildings are closed. Um, and despite these challenges, she's highlighted some positives, um, which I thought was important to talk about. Um, the ELLs have experience with remote learning, such as students taking charge of their own learning and working at their own pace, which I thought was interesting. Um, teachers can more easily differentiate lessons of increased opportunities to interact with students and their families. Um, so the teachers working with the students at home are able to get, kind of get to know the families a little bit more. Um, so how we can support ELLs and their families. Um, I did get a list of resources that I will pass on to the board and to um, superintendents and assist assistant superintendents, but um, I thought it was interesting. She stressed the importance of initial interviews with families in determining and meeting the student's language acquisition needs. So when the student comes into the district, meeting with the families ahead of time and kind of finding out what they need from us. Um, she highlighted a number of factors that enhance staff's ability to meet students' needs, such as an ENL professional development for all staff and time for teachers to co-plan um, for co-teaching as well as process monitoring language acquisition um, versus content acquisition. Um, she also discussed supports to families to help educate and empower them to assist their students learning and understand the district services and expectations. Uh, she noted it was important to communicate with parents in their preferred language both written and oral, and that they may not be the same. Um, she talked about outreach um, that Hush, Rush Henrietta has been doing, um, such as translating informational videos for parents into their own native language and having multi multilingual parent forums. Um, and again, I'll share all the resources, but I thought it was actually, it was really great. Good, thank you. And the Labor, Labor, Labor Relations Committee, is there uh, any com anything to share with about that? Yes. Um, that Zoom meeting was on um, uh, January 18th, I believe, and um, it was on workforce availability during this pandemic. And the, there were two um, HR people, um, the Fairport HR person and the Webster one, as well as um, the lawyer from Harris Beach, Sarah Visengard. And as we've already heard, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been especially challenging for school districts from a staffing standpoint. He noted that, um, that the challenges faced initially were different from what they face now, and they will likely continue to change throughout the pandemic. Um, the, they reviewed the guidance that was provided from the governor in July and August so that schools could reopen. The discussion then went on that the, um, the unique nature of each district's plans to reopen school when it came to the format of instruction, bargaining agreements, and variability of their staff affected staffing. And it, it, there's a whole list of, of things that were affected. Um, the, the um, lawyer from Harris Speech provided example scenarios that would require accommodations to keep staff in place. And there's a whole bunch of um, things that were um, discussed. Um, and she noted that these regulations in some cases are changing as well as, uh-oh, and I lost it. Okay. It just went, oh, here it is. Um, that they're still changing even now. Um, so one of the biggest thing was the number of times staff may be paid for quarantine orders is not clear, specific, especially since healthcare workers can be paid up to three times, but districts have been paying a maximum of working 10 days. Um, the, it was a, an amazing presentation and um, just trying to encapsulate everything right here isn't doing its service. What's wonderful is that it is uploaded on the um, Monroe County School Board's website, and I would highly recommend um, the board, if you know, have any downtime, <laughs> um, to go and, and because it was just a very good presentation um, of explaining about what's happening with our own staff during this whole pandemic and the fact that. Um, and I know that the last um, board meeting that we had, Dr. Putnam 
referred to the fact that when we have virtual, our virtual classes, and if the teacher is absent, there's no virtual subs. Well, they talked about that, that mm -hmm. it, it's Monroe County wide, it's statewide. So there, you know, it, it was, I highly recommend it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Then we have district uh, community committee meetings. We have the audit committee meeting. Of course, we've just heard the audit reports and approved the audit reports. Is there anything additional to come out of the committee meeting? Okay. You did a great Thank job. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then BOCES board candidates. So the BOCES is board is made of representatives from the various member school districts. Uh, there's a number of them up for re-election this year. Uh, Penfield was last year, so yep. these, this is, not, but we all have to approve each other's candidates. So the following BOCES board members' terms end as of June 30th, 2021, uh, which is, and they include Robert Dixon for Restor West Aronquay Central School District, Tom Nespa for the Webster Central School District, make sure I'm not missing any here, uh, Maureen Nupp for the Fair Fairport Central <coughs> School District, Sora Sox for Brighton, and Nancy Samal for East uh, Aronicoid. The BOCES members are elected by their con component member boards and voted on the same day, designated for the vote of the tentative administrative budget. This year's BOCES administrative budget vote is April 20th, 2021, and will occur at our regular scheduled meeting. So is there there's no unfinished business. Is there any new business? No. So uh, upcoming meetings, February 23rd, we have the um, next Board of Education meeting and February 25th is the policy committee meeting. So may I have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 931. So moved. Second. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Any opposed? Meeting adjourned.